sometimes the envelopes we have in the house aren't big enough, and we decide, okay, I can get most of it in there. Some parts must dangle. That's okay. If you find a place to put a rectangle over something where it fits in a little better and other parts have to stick out, that's okay. You do that with the, uh, the cube that you use for the head. You could include the nose, but you don't. If that's a side view of a head, then you put another eyeball out here. You'll find a ball that goes in there. There'll be an egg on the front of it, and you get the most perfectly proportioned skulls, and they don't include the nose because the nose can be significant. Or less than significant. These are experiments to see angles, to sensitize to graphic design. Now let's go back to the drawing. Good drawing and complicated. Simpler straight on views may be best to start with if you are beginning. Learn how to measure proportion of a human figure with some straight on views and a straight line and a halfway point and then we can divide this up however we want it will say head like that rib cage like that pelvis like that legs like so but then where do we go well when we think anatomically we're gonna put shoulders on there we'll put arms on there they'll have a hand and so on but look at what he's done here he has already been thinking as we are thinking with this of graphic design so that in silhouette that would read very clearly as a woman's torso but the angle that he has, this, that if you run that line down, it might meet the other long line right about here. Back here, he's accentuating the wideness of her back. And that angle is aiming about there. These are things to notice. Let's see, if we run these up here, they're landing right there at about that seventh cervical vertebrae and making two triangles that can be discerned by observing. How does this one go? If that goes like that, it's right about the same point. Pit of the neck is a little lower than the seventh cervical vertebrae, but close enough. Uh, that is one way of analyzing and front views and back views are easy to do that with because of their symmetry now rather than take more time on this if you want to see more on how angles can help you copy Proko has a video on it and so does a former student of mine who did a very clear simple one you can look it up on YouTube or type in that cryptic URL, which is almost as much work as citing itself. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes here to boil down the lessons. When it comes to copying proportionally, to try to get things accurate, to see the way it lays out on the paper, here's a list of secrets. Verticals and horizontals, because they're easy to discern and we use them to compare other angles. And you can consider working on grid paper because with grid paper, it's built in everywhere. Here's another, halfway and third divisions because they're easy to discern and they keep us from going way off. Here's another, triangles and degrees of angles because verticals and horizontals aren't necessarily shapes. Triangles are shapes. 
and they can be discerned. And degree numbers remind us that they really are at a particular angle. Can we look at an angle and name it? We can, we're seeing accurately. And simple as possible shapes because this is complex. The biggest secret of interpreting proportions accurately is to reduce to simplicity. These were attempts. Sometimes he practically does the work for us. Look at how you can find triangles in there. How would we triangulate that? Just maybe take it all the way up to there. If we can get the axis of that triangle and know that it's not shaped like this, and it's not shaped like this, its proportion a little narrower. That is starting with a something. That's not too bad right there. To call that a triangle. Bridgman is thinking this way. And other ways too. Here is your homework, by the way. Uh, if you want an assignment as opposed to a project, this is more of an assignment than a project. Draw shape analyses of favorite Bridgman images. That's a shape. That's a shape. That's a shape. That's a sh it's also a form, yeah, but it's not what we're doing tonight. That's a shape. That's a more complex shape, but it is a shape. This shape is quantifiable. It looks like a one-piece bathing suit straight lines are either in the position they need to be to make that shape or they are not. So you, when you put a curved line like this, how can you copy that line exactly? It's really hard to do. But if you turn it into that, 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 and that, every one of those straight lines has a specific degree. Turn it into a few graphic chunks. See the whole upper torso like this. How simply can you group together the shape of the upper legs as a unit? Okay, lower legs and feet, both feet. This is to try to see graphically much as you can use straight lines. They exaggerate graphicness. Back to the drawing. And then where do we go with this? We go to where we'll go like this. And now, 
I can just find this, almost feel it, as if I were in that position. Looks very stumpy there, but that's okay. This person's got their head crunched down. They've got their shoulder up there bigger. That arm actually comes out further this way. Somebody asked, should you start, when you draw, should you start with those points and those lines? The people I know that do the most exciting drawings never start with those points and those lines. You use those points and those lines to study. And then when you draw, if you start gesturally, you can adjust as I am adjusting to bring this guy's foot further out so that it is not now concerned with an accurate copy. It's concerned with whether he feels like, see, this is in a position like this. I had this way up here, but now I feel like if that leg is pressing out like this, then that this one might be aiming back down to come down to here, and that's more empathy with this figure than it is measuring it. Now we'll take this up more in pose and balance when we're talking about gesture. I'm gonna put this back up so that you can see the whole thing. I'm going to look at the Q&A and see what we've got. What would be the end goal of the shape analysis? Training the brain to simplify? Exactly. The end goal of shape analysis is training the brain to see in simple shapes. It heightens sensitivity. It means that when we do a drawing, we become aware of the simple shapes. There are many ways to study drawing from Bridgman. A few years ago, I was practicing pen and ink technique, trying to learn to put lines down in single sweeps. The only preliminary drawing was done right there with the ink. Sometimes the pen would behave well and I could do a little form study. Sometimes the pin would misbehave and I'd have to pull the blop along in the hope of making something exciting, a style I wanted to play with. What was my motive here? One objective only, to get comfortable with ink, not to learn anatomy and form, to take a leaky pin throw a line down and let it do something maddening and see if I could, instead of freaking out, use it. Attitude training. A whole different thing from straight line analysis. This was an impulse drawing, no reference, done in less than a minute to see how it would go. Problems, of course. That leg is longer than this one. That arm is longer than a human arm would be. This was an exercise, practicing throwing raw pin lines down to get beyond my fear of them. A whole different thing from your project tonight, though you will work on this when we study rhythm next week. Here we are doing a different exercise, straight line analyses, seeking the shapes of components. That is the best exercise I can offer you to get ready for what we will do next. That's for you if you're beginning. If you're advanced, approach this however you like. Now, I did this one last week. And this is an actual Bridgman, and this I did with a rollerball. And I want to tell you something about it. This piece that Bridgman did might be 
as big as a human head. This was done with a rollerball and a business card will cover it in my sketchbook. But I was not working on technique here. I was working on the thing that you might want to work on, which is to look at how he dares to throw that center line on the back that far back. Look at how he dares to place this pelvis with the arrowhead facing that way. That's a landmark point. I don't ever dare to do that. In fact, even in this attempt to dare to do that, I still made it a little, t I might want to say I want to do it more than that. Look at how he gets squash and stretch on that neck. Look at how he stretched that into a concave line because it's going to squash over here. And look at how I didn't. But if I did this over again, I'd, I'd say from here to there is pulling and stretch it like saran wrap. You do different drawings for different purposes. But one thing I did do is what we're segueing into now. I did try to see the rib cage, even though he didn't draw that rib cage on here. I tried to see the rib cage the way he saw the rib cage so that I get that crunch over there and get this point there where it stretches. Different drawings for different purposes. And here's where we go to three shapes. Bridgman, in his ideal figure, chooses to make the rib cage a beach ball. It's not a perfect beach ball. It's a beach ball that's not full of air completely and it's a hot summer day and it's starting to wobble a little bit. And he pulls out that thoracic arch. Now you say, hey Marshall, I bet you're going to teach us that that thoracic arch is three-dimensional like that, right? and it's got a center line on there like that, and that you can wrap rubber bands around it and make it 3D, and that we could do the same thing and look down on it. Now we're gonna look down on that beach ball, and there's the opening of that rib cage like that, and then that center line that went down there like that is gonna go like so, and then that thoracic arch, which is going to be in there like that. We're gonna still learn how to make it 3D. We sure are. So should we do that tonight? You sure shouldn't. Because tonight we have a job, and that is to see simple shapes. Three of them. What are they? You've got that in your Bridgman book. How are they useful? If you make a rib cage that's sort of shaped like a rib cage, we'll say that we've got that sternum on there, and you put it in a box. What do you do with the other parts? Well, what do we know about a pelvis? A pelvis on a man is as wide as a rib cage, on a woman a little wider. How high is a pelvis? It's less high than a rib cage. How high exactly, though? What would you say? Can you divide it into thirds? Yeah, I'd say it's about two thirds. So if I'm going to make it this wide, female pelvis, then how high would I make it? About two thirds of that. There we go. How high is the head? About the same height as the pelvis. How wide is it? Oh, it looks to me like it's about half the width of the rib cage. My goodness, I'm learning. So that means if I could take this width 
and make the rib, the head, the box that the head fits in, same height as the pelvis, that's going to do fine. Say, so how about the space in between them? How about the space in between them? Hey, here's the thing about the space in between them. It changes. Go like this. It changed quite a bit. Go like that. It changed quite a bit. There's the last part of your assignment. Memorize the three relative masses. Measure and feel. Go through your favorite bridgements. Try to see through those figures. The head exists. It makes a shape. That may not be the true shape of a real head, but you're studying bridgement. And he reduced it to shapes like that. How about the thorax? Well, those are how he's treating it. The pelvis, hard to see before you know anatomy, but try. The puzzlement preps you to understand better later. And if you know some form, your shape analyses may reveal that. Here's a corner on these blocks, for example. If you're looking down on her thorax, a rubber band would go like that. Top of the rib cage would be there. If you're looking at this character up, you'd see that he's got cross contours that go like that and double bellied. But no need to do that, especially if you're new to it and it confuses you. Don't be afraid of overlap. It happens and it can be good. Look for these parts. Next we'll do forms. But shapes are simpler. So they are important because they are anatomical they are the big parts. They're as simple as we can reduce the core of a figure. Those are the big three of shapes with awareness of form. There is awareness of a plane break there and a plane break that would go there. But John has reduced them entirely to shapes and not afraid of overlap. Those are the big three with limbs and an appropriate simplicity of shape without any concern for form. Your turn. Memorize those three masses. Know them as components. It's a shape hunt through Bridgman. Go and do likewise. That was session two on simplifying from our 12 session 2020 summer boot camp. If you want more videos, live sessions, and updates on other offerings, subscribe to my announcement list at martialart.com. You're here to study Bridgman. This is recording three on form from our 12 session summer boot camp in 2020. Updates are always at martialart.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our third installment of the Bridgman Figure Drawing Boot Camp. I'm going to go back to our first meeting to remind you to get your head into that space of why we're here. Here's why. The Bridgman Purpose Statement this is the story of the blocked human form where the bending, twisting, or turning of volume 
gives the sensation of movement held together by rhythm. Now, that isn't the purpose. This is the story of the block to be informed where the bending, twisting, and turning volume gives a sensation of movement held together by rhythm. Let's get to the purpose. Look down here. Bridgman's purpose statement is to awaken the sense of the structure hidden beneath. Yes! Even if you do not know everything about anatomy, and you certainly won't, this is not, this is not a medical course. You know three things about anatomy. You know that there's a head and a thorax and a pelvis, and we think of these as, as things lumped together. And a lot of people don't, most people don't. They do when they call attention to it, but they don't look at a body and see three chunks of bone that move in relationship to each other. That is the purpose of Bridgman, with its lively ability. And of course, he ends with that hope that the ideas will be better, independent, and better. Good. Well, I sure wish I would have put up that slide yesterday. Now, up here, look what he has done. He has given us a line. And that line is not the base of the rib cage. This line is the base of the rib cage. And reading all sorts of things that people said at the beginning of class about how hard it was to get back to 2D thinking. Well, the whole purpose of noticing angles, there is a point of the rib cage there and a point of the ridge cage there, and that's bone. Now watch this, watch this line. This is not a perfectly horizontal line going through there, almost, but not quite. But the line of the rib cage would in fact be at right angles to that. Not necessarily on Bridgman, because he may decide to take some liberty and bend it a little bit. And there actually is a little bit of bend. How much should I bend? How long will it go? Oh, wait a second. That's not the sternum. The sternum is going to start up here. This isn't three-dimensional form. I'm just looking at the shape. You see, he's actually turned that thoracic arch into something shaped like that which has a little bit of a three-dimensionality to it. But nobody's thoracic arch is shaped like that. That's Bridgman's stylization. Now, once we get up here, we're going to do a sternum. How long would I know how to make that sternum? How Would I be able to know how long to make it? Yeah. I would figure that the width of the head, if a person's rib cage looks like it's going to be about this big, then I figure that from that chart we studied yesterday, the head will be about half of that. So that ball of the head would probably be up there, about half that width. And that face might be on it like this. And that neck might come down there like that. And I've got something to start working my proportions from. Because I had what? This and this. Now that's not three-dimensional. That's two-dimensional. Let's keep going. He's also showing us that this crunch over here, by the time we get to the pelvis, watch this, that's that anterior superior iliac spine. Here's the other one over here. And they make a line like this. So the rib cage goes like that and the pelvis goes like that. Big difference. Exaggerated squash and stretch. In fact, this is what we did yesterday as much as we could. Can you take a front view of the body and not look at all the complex shape, but find these two shapes somewhere and see if we can look through the body. What did he call it? What did he call it? He called it the structure hidden beneath. 
those two structures hidden beneath. See, but those don't look like a rib cage and a pelvis. They don't. But they're hard enough to count. And what else does he do? Let's watch. Let's watch. He says that somewhere from here and somewhere from here and somewhere down to here, it makes a convenient triangle. How does that triangle relate to my drawing? Let me show you. It puts this portion of the body on an axis that leans that way. I'll switch colors here to make the point. How about this triangle? That triangle, he is seeing. Can you see it on a body? Not really. But in his world, he says, I am seeing that triangle. And this value is that it takes us into a mode of observing, not the hidden structure underneath necessarily here, but the graphic design of the figure. Now I'm gonna move on in a moment from this slide. This was about yesterday's lesson. Now, some homework. Brendan. Brendan did some analysis of figures. Brendan. This was the idea. I do want to point out something I should have made a bigger deal of yesterday. And that is that a vertical line in there early on, wherever you want to place it, and a true horizontal a few places. Well, we decided that the groin is halfway from the top to the bottom. And to measure how wide and how tall, look at how those verticals line up there. Look at how these horizontals do not. That tells us that if we know where one shoulder is, that we could pretty much find the other knee or shoulder by saying that one is at this level. Give me just a moment. That knee is at this level, and then you run a line that you measure to the other level. This is where that great trochanter of the femur is. The eye, uh, even if you didn't know that, you'd see a point there and you say that one goes up to the other side. And you can compare heights and widths. I should have made a, a bigger deal of that. I hope you went to, to uh, Josh Reed's video to see him demo that because I thought that he did a very simple job in a short amount of time. Now, every line up there has a length and an angle. And here's something Katarina pointed out, that the negative shapes, the negative shapes become so positive emotionally. There is something about looking at those negative shapes. When we compose pictures, if we are designing anything, even a sculpture, where when you move your head around the sculpture, it's going to change altogether, looks at negative shapes and says, mm, uh, 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 until they like it. And this looking at shapes, look at this. That is something that any great artist is aware of in their training, noticing that and turning it into a little character. And that can help accuracy. That can help placing things correctly as well as designing so that it looks nice. Bridgman was certainly aware of it. Now, Brendan went a little bit beyond the call of duty. That is three-dimensional. That's what we're studying today. 
Today, I am gonna do this about 20 times. Watch what I do over here on the right. I'm gonna tell you, as some of you have been in my classes in school, that that's a something, that's a block. It isn't a block yet, but it will be. And am I looking up at it or down at it? Well, I see underneath it. So I'm figuring that the convex rubber band that wraps that way is gonna tell me that I see this part down there. And is it spun to my right? Yeah, it's spun to my right so that I'd see over there on that ear. So I could put a center line on it that way or I could shave off that plane. And that is enough to help me find the three structure lines that will design a three-planed, six-planed actually, but three that are visible when it's tipped like this box. The vertical line, the oblique line, the horizontal line. I'm gonna do that a whole bunch of times today. If you're brand new to it, it might hurt. If you're not brand new to it, I hope it's going to propel you to do further. And in a week or so, we're going to turn that neck into something that would wedge into there and then try to find the muscle that would go from there and then into there and the other one that's going to wrap around and do some development into anatomy. Now, Brendan, uh, you're here. I don't have mic access, but I spent a lot of time thinking about these. It was fun. Bless you, Brendan. You know that a person is on their way to doing good work when they say, I spent a lot of time and it was fun. It doesn't mean that if it wasn't fun, you won't do well. Everything's not fun sometimes. But if you're spending a lot of time and enjoying it, that's the great secret. Okay, good job. Romana did something that is the foundation this stuff that Bridgman shows us in the book when he shows you the cross sections of a body from top to bottom. Why? So that you can have an intellectual exercise? Say, I'm smart. I know the cross sections of the body. It's not why. It's a hidden structure, not so hidden when you're an artist. It's to create your own light source. Cross sections allow you to define the form without shading. And then when you decide to put the light here or the light there, you've got a rubber band around there or a little cross contour around there. See, this faces up. This faces down. No, it doesn't. It's all one flat screen surface. Yeah, but in our pretend world, we put a line like that and a line like that, and we have in that pretend world something facing this way that receives light, something facing this way that doesn't. That is the shortest and simplest I can explain of how planes give the illusion of rendered form when you know the cross sections in all directions. Okay, Romana, good job. Now, let's take a look at a few more and we'll spend less time on these and we're gonna move on, but I want you to see what students are doing and I hope this is useful to you. Sasha did three studies. One of them is full of planes and shading. One of them is fewer planes without shading and showing us that we see this side. Let me darken that. We see this side. And this is another side over here. And this is a third side over here, like a block. And then when we come up here, that side disappears because her torso is twisted to where this is facing more down that way and that is facing more toward us. And over here, rhythm and continuity lines and one line that might flow into another and another that might flow in another and straight line angles. Good job, Sasha. This is homework that takes time and that drills into our habits and 
and perception being, but this is the one I'm going to land on. This is the one we're going to take the rest of the session today to deal with. Sudipta. Look what Sudipta is doing here. Two studies. One of them is what you'll do tonight and for the coming week. Three big forms. We're going to understand that. But just in case there's a temptation to say it's all about form. No, it isn't all about form. It's also about graphic design. And if you do this and you say it's a little st uh, stylistically and technique wise, it looks a little careful. That's OK. Because I predict that Sudipta in paying attention to these skills will eventually go in there and say like that, like that, like that, like that. And also maybe even when it comes to the pen and ink or some other medium that allows you to go thick and thin by pressing down, you'll start with a thin one and then get really thick and you'll have a line quality that is like a musician running the bow across the violin strings or the cello strings and getting some guts out of them. But these things take time and a lot of energy. And that's what you're here for. This is the month that you do it. Now, we've spent a lot of time on that one. What was the point of it? More than one way to approach this. Robert Beverly Hale, many things at once. Conscious mind can't do it. Subconscious mind must. How must subconscious mind? spending a lot of time, a month or a few years, acquainting the subconscious mind with these different disciplines. And what we deal with now is what I told you we would, the thickening of the figure through forms and variations. All right, what does Bridgman call them? He calls them the three masses. It's a Catholic term. Better change that. Uh, the three forms. In one of his books, Constructive Anatomy, the first book, or one of the, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, I think, the first book, uh, 1920, he says in there, these three forms, think of them as the body of a wasp with only one line connecting them or without reference at all to connecting portions. Really? You'd make a head and a rib cage and a pelvis and not even care about the spine that connects them? Or even a line that connects them? No, just floating, floating wasp parts. Well, that's an interesting observation. Floating wasp body parts. That could be useful. I never noticed it before. Uh, but even though those wasp sections are connected by the spine, as much as that spine can move, the muscles will take it there. And we'll get to the muscles later. Ah! Now look what we've got. Three parts. Each one of these boxes, as we said, is in a different position. We're looking at that top box. We're looking up into the base of it. We're looking up into the base of this one, the chest, and we're looking up into that pelvis. All three of them are looking up. Hey, this one we're looking level with. We're looking up at the chest and we're looking, what about that? We're looking down at the head. Now, that explains why these three forms are the core forms we study in studying the figure. And because this is facing a different way than this one's facing, and these are this is facing a little different too, every one of them is different, we've got to have three ways of doing this. Here is where we get serious, and here is where 
you need some paper because we're going to spend a good deal of time on this slide, but you're going to learn. I'm going to teach. I hope you're going to learn. Everything on the head, in this case, everything on the head gets lumped into one box. You say, but doesn't part of the head move? Yes, there is a joint right there called the temporal mandibular joint, and that jaw can open up and clench down. So aren't we going to account for that? No. We are going to lump the whole head in there so that wherever that block goes, that head will go. Everything about the chest, the thorax, that's what they call it with a wasp body. Everything gets lumped into one box, but doesn't the thorax change shape when you breathe in and breathe out? Your doctor cares about that. She'll put a megaphone or a, a stethoscope on there to listen to what happens when we breathe, but artists don't want to worry about that to start out and make it too complicated. What about this pelvis? Unless you are giving birth, that pelvis is rock solid and everything about it will fit into a block. Okay, now we understand why we're doing this. These three masses, each one has its own set of, what's the word? Coordinates. Its own set of lines. These lines, complex as they are, can be turned into simple systems. Let's take uh, let's do a little drawing of the head tipped down a little bit so that we know that this head is in a different position. It's aiming down. The eyes would be there. The ear would be there. The nose would stick out there, cast a little shadow. The eye sockets would cut in. The chin would be there. Just want to give you enough to see that's going to be, that could be eventually, a head. Now, what about that chest? Well, let's do what he does. We're looking down at that head. What if we were to look up? At that chest. We're going to make the front plane there, and we're going to look slightly up at this. Is that possible? Maybe not. But I'm going to go ahead and do it. And then that pelvis? Let's do something really hard to do. Let's look down at the pelvis and make it overlap. overlap a bit. With the box for the ribcage. When we name the three line systems, We have to do something that won't confuse us. We're gonna call left to right, we're gonna color it red here. Every line that goes left to right, we're gonna color it red and we're going to name it X. Well, why name it X? That's confusing. Why not just say left to right? Here's why we don't name it left to right. Because look at the drawing at the left. And look what these X lines will look like over here at the left. Watch this. There's an X line. There's an X line. There's an X line. There's an X line. It's going into the paper. It's not going left to right on the paper. It's going into the paper. And so we don't want to call it left to right. We don't want to call it a width 
line because what about positions where it has no width on the paper? What if it's, de it's pure depth over there on this figure? Pure depth. So we'll call it X. Now there's another line, another one of these three line systems, and it is for height. We'll color it blue because it goes up to the sky, which today in Southern California may be sweltering. We're in a desert, but the sky is, in my view, blue. Hey, look over here at the left. They stay height lines. The Y line is for up and down. And when we swivel it, we see them in all of their up and downness. I'll be doggone. Now, what if they don't go up and down? What if a person is lying down, reclining, and the up and down lines go perfectly horizontal. Well, you don't call them up and down lines, so we, what do we, that's why we call them Y, because that way they stay consistent no matter which way they swivel. We got one more set, and that would be the ones that go from front to back, the depth lines. Now, over here on the left, we're coloring them green, those depth lines, which we will call Z, can we see them on the front view? Well, we'd see a little green dot that goes back on the depth of the figure, but we would not see them as a line system. Hey, how come the blue lines never had a point where they made a dot? What view would the blue lines make a dot? Right, top down. We were looking straight down on this. The blue lines would make a dot. I'm going to go ahead and do it. And then the depth of this head from above would have lines like that. Those are the Z lines. And the width of this head from above would go across like that. And then we could draw so that you'll know what I'm doing in case oh, Marshall drew a box, supposed to be the figure. Watch this. The ears would stick out like that. The nose would stick out like that and the shape of the head as it fits in the box would be something like that, a little narrower at the front. You get the idea. We have just named the three axes, the three coordinates. If you want to take a screen grab of that, feel free to do it, but if you're drawing this on your paper, Getting it on a screen grab isn't going to help you nearly as much as getting it into your brain. And to do this several times, and I recommend you know this if you've taken other classes with me, and I'm sorry that every time I teach anything having to do with draftsmanship, I always bring this up. But when my son was five, six years old, and he wanted me to teach him something about perspective, and I, I taught him a little. Five-year-old brain is not fit for understanding abstract concepts like perspective. But he did understand that X was width, Y was height, Z was depth. And we looked at, at pictures to see if we could name it. And the way we did it was X, Y, Z. And to get that into you, to get into thinking about those things, you're thinking about the axes. Okay, I'm going to pause for a moment.
This is why Bridgman says that this is the story of the blocked human. Well, this is the story of turning the human body into blocks. Well, why turn it into blocks? It's not made out of blocks. It's made out of round things. Yeah, round things, as you're going to see in a few moments here, are really tough. Now, some of you might say, why do some 3D apps swap out the X and the Z? I don't know why. But it doesn't make any difference. You can name these anything. You can name these three line systems Eric, Shane, and Rembrandt. It doesn't make any difference as long as we keep them consistent so that we can track where we are with these forms. Now, I should say, those of you who are perspective students, those of you who are concept designers who do environments, those of you who work with 3D programs, you already know this. I am trying to do this for a person who is a beginner. I'm trying to do this for a sixth grader so that you understand the concept, and I hope I didn't hurt you too much. But those of you who know more about it, uh, know that the environment has a whole different set of coordinates. When you lie down, you lay down the room will have an X, Y, and Z, and the things in the room can tumble all over the place, but that's exactly why we use this. This is a left-brained scientific way of understanding three-dimensional space by reducing it to the three dimensions. Width, height, depth. Okay. Now, Bridgman, in the book, even includes inches. Those of you in other countries of the world who know about the better measuring system, I, I don't want to take responsibility for my country, and I don't want to take responsibility in a number of reasons, for a number of reasons. One of them is why this country did not adopt the metric system, which when I heard about it, I was a kid when I heard about it. Why don't we do that? That's easier to learn. Cost too much money. So Bridgman, in his book, in the United States in the early 20th century, actually reduces these things or describes these things uh, in their inches, which is not that helpful actually, because it's it's relative to the size you're working. But there he's showing us something. Now I want to see if we can apply this or see how he does it in his pictures. Let's take a moment to see. Well, sure enough, this analysis, Bridgman is showing us this is not just something we do in a textbook. I'm going to actually draw a figure here, and I'm going to turn it into three separate things, and I'm going to make one that I'm looking up at, and another that I'm looking up at, and another that I'm looking down on. Now, look what I did. The logic is that if this end of a cylinder is closer to me, the rubber band, watch the rubber band, very important that you're watching right now, it curves convex to the direction that it's going away. Oh, I got the axis of this one all wrong. That, that's okay. The axis is actually going straight up and down. I've got it going that way. But this end is closer to me. So the line will curve convex as it goes away. Whereas over here, this end is closer to me. You say, well, I can't see into it on a real human body. That's okay. We're trying to think of something that says that's closer. And if it were a cylinder, the line would curve that way as it goes away, convex as it goes away. So I made a convex line, and that got me started with three-dimensional lumps. Yesterday, we talked all about shapes. Today we are talking about forms. I'm going to switch to blue here, and I'm going to do these again. I'm going to do uh, this one. We're going to say we've got a something there that's a shape, something like that. And we've got a something here that is a shape, something like this. And we've got a something here that is a shape, something like this. Now. That may not be very accurate, but here's what I'm trying to see. 
I'm trying to see that he's thinking that way even more. Let's get it a little better. He's thinking that that thing is, that pelvis is angled that far. So I might want to take into account that the what line system would this be? Let's think, what line system would this be if it's going from one side to the other? That has got to be an X line going off to the X line vanishing point. Well, my goodness. If I've got that X line because I went through side to side, I can be pretty sure that every line on that block that goes that direction is going to go that direction. I made it blue. That's okay. I'm just going to make it blue. We'll swap out X and Z. Or no, Y, y and X in this case. Now, what about depth? Well, how would I know that the depth, which I'm going to use as another color, how would I know that the depth would go this way? I don't. In fact, that block might even be, watch this, the depth of that line. If that's the width line, the depth of that block might be going that way. That might be a better interpretation. Let's see. That would mean that we were actually, if we could see through that leg, we'd be looking up a little at that block. You say, well, Marshall, if I'm going to do these studies this week, how do I know which one? Play with them. If this were a real figure in real three-dimensional space and not an invention George Bridgman was doing while he was standing in front of a group of people, there'd be an objective truth about it. But it's a, it's a drawing, and he might have changed his mind from top to bottom. Hey, here's what it means. It means that if we go from there and aim back there, and then we could see the hidden lines. Well, I think we better switch to green then for the height lines. And we're going to do that, and that, and that. And we have got a something now that Whatever it's missing for organic qualities, it's certainly not missing anything for telling us the position of that mass. This we are definitely looking up at. I'll just switch to black now so that I don't have to keep switching between. Uh... Oh, look over here from that corner. Let's see, somewhere around here over to there tells me that that width line is going to go like that so I'm going to say that this block has got to be in a position like that maybe even tighter I'm not daring to exaggerate as much as he did and I'm going to look up at that block and that looks enough like what George Bridgman is getting at and then that head oh that head let's see if I could put a center line on there, it's going in the same direction that this line is. Instead of a center line, I'm going to try finding the edge of that block, and I'll go like this, but now the lines are not going, oh, excuse me, the depth lines are not going away from me to the left. They are going away from me to the right, and so I would build a block where I'd be looking up underneath it. And now, we have a head in a different position than the chest. I'm going to pause for a moment. Marshall? Yes. Uh, I I'm seeing a great question uh is it is it palin yeah. the question is are these x's y's and z's parallel to other x y's and z's if we think of them in perspective they are parallel to every x y and z on that block not to any other x y and z's when a when a when a block is tumbling when this block 
is in this position. It doesn't know anything about the position this block is in. And then if I'm going to move it into this position, it doesn't know anything about that. So each block carries its own set of axes. Now, does that answer the question or did that make it more confusing? Uh, Sarah says, I struggle finding the Z-axis for boxes. They can go so many ways. Yeah, yeah, that's why. That's why perspective takes six months to a year of concentration. But you already know my opinions on that. We did a whole hour long podcast or so on how to study perspective. I'm trying to give you a very beginning perspective introduction right now. And horizon lines aren't coming into it. Well, yeah, they are kind of. Why? Let's, let's give a little bit of attention to that. Let's go back to this one. Oh, that's a good one. Hey, where's the horizon line? Well, let's find it. The horizon line must be somewhere here. He's kind of sloppy, but these are definitely meeting somewhere down here. Okay, I got it. The horizon line is there. Now, that means that, hey, what the, what, wh wh why is that one aiming up? Have I made my point? This box doesn't know anything about this box's horizon line. Oh, is it saying my eye is up here? No. It's saying that you can have a box that is level. Let's do it. Let's do it three ways. A box that is level. A box that is a little below our eye. A box that is well below our eye. Now watch what I do. A box that is above our eye. And you say, I got it, it all makes sense. But watch this, watch this. A box down here that is also above our eye. How did that happen? Because this box doesn't know anything about this box. Every box is different. Now, if that became confusing, I'm going to put it on you. The confusion is that you are so locked onto the thing perspective teachers tell you at the beginning. I do too. You have to know where the horizon line is. That's where you start. That's where you start when you're creating an environment. It's not necessarily where you start when you're creating a head because the horizon line might be down here. And you say, it sure is. If I turn that into a box, it's gonna go down to there. I got it, Marshall. Uh, what about if the person puts their head down? What about if a person tilts their head down? Uh, well, it doesn't work anymore. So a better question then where is the horizon line is this. Am I looking up at this head? Yeah, that means I'll see underneath it. Is it facing to my left or right? Looks like it's facing to my left. Therefore, I'll put a line like that. Now, one of you said that Z line is so confusing, but you see how just by doing that, saying I can see underneath it, I could snap that rubber band tight and snap that rubber band tight and lo and behold, it's not going to be accurate that way, but it's going to be useful. What about this one? Even if my eye is down here at the leg, if that person puts their head down, I can say that head, which part's closer the top is. Okay, I'll shave off that top and I can see it. Now I get a corner. Snap that rubber band tight. Watch this, those of you who have trouble with a Z line. It looks right. How did you know it was right? I didn't know it was right. I've just drawn a lot of blocks. And if you draw a lot of blocks, you start to say that looks right enough. Nicholas has summed it up. 
Nicholas asks, so when we are creating these boxes forms, we are creating three distinct forms. Yes! Do we technically not need to worry about horizon lines at all? No, we don't need to worry about them practically at all. Isn't it necessary to make sure that three forms look coherent in relationship to each other? Well, I, I, you're putting something on it that we don't need. Is this, is this head not coherent with this one? Is this head not coherent with this one? Three separate forms. Now, I, the reason why I think people get confused is that you're sticking with a maxim. Got to know where the horizon line is. You do. When you're plotting out perspective in an environment, it's one of the it's the first thing practical. But when you're spinning a block around, I want you to know that when I spin this block around, rough as I'm drawing it, I know that this is not impressing you. This is worse than a lump of barbecue charcoal. But I can spin it so that this side comes more toward me and looks like this. Now watch what I do. Those of you who have trouble with the Z lines, it was aiming that way. This one was aiming that way. But if I'm going to pull it down there so that now it's aiming more level, doesn't it make sense that this one's going to go more up and that plane will become more foreshortened? Can I do it further? Am I thinking of a vanishing point? No, just thinking that direction, that direction. Can I make it so that it's almost a side view? Yeah, let's do it at almost a side view. Make it so that this is even a little more horizontal, and then that goes very straight up. And now it's just a little sliver of what was a front plane. Terrible perspective, but it works. It's spinning it. What would happen if we spun it all the way over that way? It could end up looking like this. It sure could. Now we spun this over to there and it landed here and it came from there. And then we say, I don't like to look down on it so much. Watch this, watch this. I'm not going to look down on it so much. I'm going to bring it up a little closer to my eye, my eye level. Say, that's a horizon line thing, right? Watch this. I'm going to bring it up a little closer to my eye level. I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that line that was going up there that way go a little less up. Ooh, now I'm not looking up at it so much. Can I bring it up further? Yeah, I'm going to bring it up further to where I lift it up over my head. Like that, it's the same thing. There was that, and now it's up there. And can I spin it? so that I see more of this side? Yeah, let's do that. Let's spin it so that we see more of that side. And now the X is over here and it's gonna be less of that and more of this O over here and so on and so forth. Were you thinking about horizon lines? Sort of. I was thinking about the lines go up. The lines go up when you're looking down on it. The lines go down when you're looking up at it and the lines go both ways a little up and a little down when you're looking level at it uh, draw a box is the foundational you draw a box is a place that I have not gone through the exercises but I the the, the thinking is all, all of this and uh, Modern Day James, too, takes you through this. Jonathan asks, can I mark X, Y, I, and Z on the figure I drew at the right? Was that a long time ago? Yeah, that was 20 minutes ago. Sorry, Jonathan. But hey, Jonathan, how about you mark them? If a five-year-old can do it, width across any part of the body is X. Height any part of the body, even if it's lying down, we're going to call that Y. Depth, anything that goes from the front toward the back of the body, we're going to call it Z. Oh, well, Kate, 
Yes, I can clarify that. What does this corner represent? You know what it represents. It represents the corners of the rib cage, more or less, not exactly. What would the sternum look like? Something like that. What does this represent? It represents the corner of the pelvis. Uh, I'm a little confused. Does each box have its own horizon line? Yeah. So that means I have to draw a horizon line for each one. No. I'm going to erase this and start over again to make see if I can clarify. This will be a last uh, point about this. Let's go to blue. If I'm going to draw a box that I'm looking down on, any line that goes away will go up. Was I thinking about a horizon line? No. I was just figuring I want to see the top of that box. How will I see the top of that box? I'll have to run a line up. What if I wanted to see the bottom of the box? Well, if I want to see the bottom of the box, I can't run a line up or I won't see the bottom of the box. I'm going to have to run a line down to see the bottom of the box. So yeah, there might be a horizon line down there, but I'm sure not thinking about vanishing points. I'm just aiming in a direction. Now the same thing, if that's the front of the box and I want to see less of the front, what if I wanted to see the back of the box? Watch what I'd do. I would spin these lines. There's only three lines so that the back of the box, presumably over there, now shows itself over here. Okay, we need to move on. Let's see, the horizon lines will be able to leave the environment. The mass of the body have perspective in relation to the other. Good, Clarice. Forget the horizon line for now. That's only important if all the boxes are exactly in the same orientation. I think I made that point when I pointed out the horizon line for all four of them. Our eye can be down there. We're lying on the beach, and these are people who are walking. We're looking up at all of them. How can I, if you're looking up at him, how can I do that? Watch me. You're looking up at me. The camera is right uh, at the level of my mouth. So you're looking up at my forehead. Now watch. I can tip that bald head towards you and you're looking down. I'm, oh, I can't understand that. What happened to the horizon line? Just think of the boxes, not, not the beach and the ocean and the environment. Bridgman is telling us the rib cage is shaped like a circle from the front. It certainly isn't shaped like a circle from the side. Remember what it's shaped like from the side? It's shaped a bit like a flattened egg. And then that pelvis is quite blocky, especially when you get flesh on it. And then that football, and then that calf, and then that foot. That got us going. But from the front, it's shaped a bit like, enough like a circle to him. And if it's anatomically accurate, it would be shaped like an egg with the small part at the top. He is simplified and stylized. But look what we find out here. Now I'm going to talk about the three sections. First of all, let's start with a very quick drawing of three rib cages. Thinking of them as eggs. This is a rib cage, and I'm going to look up at it. And there is a sternum on there that, if it were a complete egg, would go like that. And another section 
this wide part, eighth rib is the widest part. Watch what I do. I'm going to put a rubber band that way. It goes like that. How did I do that? Well, that was sophisticated perspective. I'll tell you. But that's just one. Now we're going to do something facing the other direction and looking down on it. We're going to see into the top of the rib cage. We're going to put the sternum there like that. And we're going to say that we are, let's wrap a rubber band around it. That would be a transverse section. Put a corner of a rib cage there and a corner of a rib cage there. And we're going to see, can we make this look like we're looking down on it? We can. We got one we're looking up at and it goes, it faces up to our right. One we're looking down at it and it's facing over to our left. And let's do this one where we're almost level with it, maybe a little below our eye. You say, how do you mean below our eye? I can see into the top of it. I'm going to deal with that in a moment. Remember that from the side view, a rib cage has a longer back and a shorter front. A shorter front and a longer back. That's too big a rib cage, but life goes on. Now that means, watch this, that angles down. So even if our eye were right here, if our eye level were right here, we'd still see down into that. And then we put a sternum on there. A single line will do. And then we look for something like a corner of the rib cage that might be one and that night hey look watch this watch this if that's a corner and the other one is a corner over there we're guessing at what they are the line aims up that means i could put a dot there and a dot there and that would tell me that i'm looking ever so slightly at a corner watch how it makes sense when we turn it into three line systems ever not, not looking down that much, but you get the idea. And then we're going to find a way to curve that line and curve that line and give ourselves something that will look three-dimensional. Now, the quality of these drawings using the zoom drawing tools, which I would apologize, I do apologize for it, because I know those are, are the line quality is just abominable. But that might be the best way to do it. The lump of barbecue charcoal to just show you line like this, line like that. Beautiful lines can happen with you or later. Now we're going to do this slowly. And I'm going to do it bigger. And I'm going to explain each point. And I'm going to start. Those ones that I just did, I started with an egg. I started with something like that put a rubber band around it. That tells me I'm looking down on it. Watch the pencil. Watch the pencil. Don't be drawing right now. Watch this. I could say that it's that's the center and it's facing toward me, but I'm not saying that. I'm going to say that the center is right here and it's facing to my right. Oh, the cross contour. That sagittal section did it. And then I want something similar, but at a 90 degree angle so that I've got all three sections. You can do that too, but you'll do it easier with about 10 to 20 hours of concentration on boxes and ellipses. So don't kill yourself if you can't understand that. I'm doing it simply to show you that it can be done without a lot of fuss, but now I'm going to do it with a lot of fuss. Let's put this rib cage into a box on which we look down. How do you know that we're looking down? Because the lines that go away 
go up. Are we looking extremely down on it? Take a look at it. We're looking down enough on it. How do you control how down you look on it? How up the lines go. The more up they go, the more you're looking extremely down on it. This is right in between. And I've only been thinking of three line systems. Up and down, the ones off to the right, the ones off to the left. Now here's a very important thing. That if you don't do this transparently, so that you can see the lines on the other side. If you don't do that, you will not be able to make these anything like precise. Now, if I'm gonna fit a rib cage into there, I think that I would need to know what it looks like if I look down on it. For example, there's going to be a small opening at the top like that. I might want to find a small opening at the top and see if I can, hey, this might be helpful. Let's get it in the center so that it's in perspective and putting a line that I'm trying to pay attention to and say that's landing right in the center on the watch this on the front it's centered left to right on the top it's centered left to right more or less on the bottom it's not exactly centered but it's close enough and on the back back there it's centered enough gosh I should probably do that along the uh, what plane what plane would this be? I'm, we're we're going to use the terms now. This section is the sagittal plane. It's the plane that is shaped like this. If you carve a little section out of it that's like a credit card standing up, that is the sagittal plane. Hey, do we need another section? I think we should have another section. I think we should have a section. And since the widest part of a rib cage, in not in Bridgman's world, but in reality, if you're studying more accurate human anatomy, is, is a little below, not in the center. So I'm gonna do a line like that, and a line like that, and a line like that. And I'm going to see if every one of these lines, if I can keep them in track, that section will be the transverse section. I'm going to draw it again over here. So there's no question that that is the section I just drew. That is the transverse section. colorize that sagittal section. We've got one more section, don't we? Uh, I wonder if anybody knows what it is. I wonder if you know what it is. That would be the one that wraps three-dimensional worlds, so you can put three bits of wrapping twine around this box. That will be the coronal section. The one that, if it's around your head facing forward, stands up like a crown. And that is this section. Coronal. How does that help me, Marshall? Let me show you. If we decide that on the top of this box there's an opening for that rib cage. But it doesn't lay flat. Remember, it angles like this. 
we might want to either watch the dot, watch the dot, we might want to pull this part down or we might want to lift this part up. Now I can tell if I lift this part up, I'm going to make it real tall, but I'm going to go and do, I'm, the reason I'm going to lift it up instead of pulling this down is that it will be easier to see what I'm doing. So I might make a tall skinny rib cage, but do you see how I'm going to do that? And then I connect with a little knowledge of ellipses. I connect something that's going to be like the opening of the top of that rib cage in perspective. What do I need to do now? Now I need to find where that sternum would be. Well, this is not touching the front. The sternum might touch the front, say, right about here. And watch this line. I can go from there to there, and I've got a line for the sternum. What about uh, the widest point that's out here? What if I put a dot right there for that widest point? That's why I put the, the little piece of string around there. Where will it be on the other side? Watch my pin, watch my pin. If I take a ride on X and go over there and touch the other side where that rubber band went all the way around, hey, I could go from, say, this side point, and that's going to give me a portion of the coronal section, the other one over there like that. What about that transverse section? Well, I know that the transverse section aims back there and aims back there, and if I were to smooth it out, if I were to smooth this out, I know that it cannot go outside of the box, so watch what I have to do. I'm going to have to get back over to that other side. And where is the corner of the rib cage? Let's place the corner of the rib cage about that height and back in there about an eyeball, about that height and then back in there about an eyeball, right about there. And I can begin to bring down, I'm doing this line right here, bring down a transverse line, like a line around the globe, and connect crucial dots. Here's a tough one. What do I do with that? That's over on the other side. But I would bring a line that would connect from that corner of the rib cage up to this part of the silhouette and from this portion that I guessed right here up to this part of the silhouette. And then cross contours. There we've got an opening of the rib cage. We've got a coronal section. We've got a couple of transverse sections. And we've got a sagittal section, which we can now make into something more like a sternum. And then get the outer contours. Now, we've only got 15 minutes left. And I told you I was going to give you permission to not do all of this work. I also will give you a link. If you want to see me do this more on YouTube, some of you already have. I'll put it in there before we finish. Now, I'm going to look at questions. If you want to build that three-form box that you made, what materials work best? Well. Here's what I did, because he suggested do it. He said, but that doesn't look like a body. I know. But for those of you who were confused, what about the horizon line? And do they all have to point to the, and how come this at least makes one point? If this is a head and this is a rib cage, the head knows not what the rib cage does. 
and vice versa. If this is a rib cage and this is a pelvis, they, the blocks that represent them have nothing to do with each other for their line systems because they can be bent all over. That's why you would take two blocks that have nothing to do with human proportion. I'd kind of like to have some blocks that look like human proportion. I went to Michael's and I put more work into this. I don't like carving. I'm not a sculptor. Uh, but I measured stuff out and I took my time and I glued things together and I put flexible wire in there so that at least this, which is notice that's not Bridgman's rib cage. That's closer to Richet's. So how long does it take to build one of these things and put that wire in it? Uh, if you want to do it so that you got something to work from, if you want to do it, what do you figure? That's up to you. I spent about four hours on it, maybe. Uh, cutting it out of sponge sure makes it easier. All right. Your homework this week is going to include to find every image in the book that shows a simplified form and give it some thought. You will not master it this week. It takes perspective training to master perspective. But you'll get familiar with it. You will start to notice if you work on this, you will start to notice that if you have a ball or an egg in front of you and it's looking right at you, that line will be straight. But if you turn it away from you, it's going to start to curve that way. Now watch the next thing. Over on the other side, transparently, it will repeat that. Am I looking up or down at that? I don't know yet. I haven't put a line on there. You have to put a, a transverse line. That's a sagittal line. But if I have a transverse line from the front view might just look like that, I can then say, oh, and I'm looking up at it. Now watch, watch this, and try to draw over to the other side so that you see the whole transparent thing. What if I did the same thing, spun the same amount, but I'm looking down on it? Let's do that. We're going to now look down on it, and you can look over to the other side and then run that sagittal line like so. And the more that we spin it, the more that we spin that egg so that that center line goes over there, the more over on the other side that line will reach it. Until eventually, this center line would become the contour, the coronal line, which was going north to South Pole, but through the side, eventually that will face us directly. And the center line, the sagittal line, will go all the way over there. So a good deal of what you're going to do this week is find all sorts of these and see if you can work on it for several hours until it happens. Maybe not this fast. Looking up at that head, look what he did. Got a line like that. Seeing underneath that chin. And is it facing this way? No, it's facing this way. Get that sagittal line. There's a transverse line. Do we need a coronal line? The ear would be right there. Yeah. Now I got a form and I can turn it into a block because I've got my three line systems and there's no question as sloppy as that is, it faces up to the left. I look up into it and the ear goes the other way. What about this chest? This chest, I'm looking up at it, no question. And the center line is right along there. And what about that pelvis? I'm going to say that I'm looking down at it. You can just start with anything that looks three-dimensional. And then I'll say 
Uh, it isn't the case here, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it because the line curved that way. I've got something like that. To get to the point where after you've done, how many of these should you do? I am telling you for your assignment this week that you should do 40 analyses of Bridgman bodies, reducing the three masses, head, thorax, and pelvis, into three transparent blocks. 40! That means 120 drawings, boxes, yeah! <laughs> Boot camp! 40 figures, 120 boxes, If you're really ambitious, three, four, five minutes per box. Try to draw them transparent, where you do the lines on the other side. But they'll be terrible boxes. They'll be better. They'll be better toward the end, probably. Especially if you take breaks. I have opinions about how to do this. If you do this for two or three hours at a time, you can hurt yourself. Your drill sergeant caring about your, uh, your, uh, your exercise. Do them 20 minutes at a time, and if it's hard, take a break, have some fun, watch cartoons. Oh, by the way, if you watch cartoons, especially classic cartoons, you'll be amazed at how animators in the 1930s and 40s, amazed at how they had this wire. Then come back, work for 20 minutes again, and do that 15 times between now and next Thursday. That's probably the better way to go, but some of you have personalities where you say, I can't work for 15 minutes. I need to work for a full hour. Okay, do that. That's all. That's all you've got to do this week. But if it was easy, try redrawing 20 of them and reduce them to organic transparent forms. That's harder. Say, I need more instruction. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you in seven minutes. I'm going to give you a link so you can watch me draw spheres based on boxes on YouTube. It's a short video, but it's the best I ever did it, and it's done roughly with a camera, and it'll make the point. Now, if you say, Marshall, I've done this so many times. This is, this is too easy. I wanted a boot camp. And you're saying, well, run around the yard three times. No, no, no. If you want an advanced task, try redrawing at least three of these in the same poses, but swivel the camera around 90 degrees, or lift the camera up, or lift the, pull the camera down. That is a challenge. That's what you would have done at the Art Students League in Kimmel Nicolaides class in a life drawing class. You wouldn't copy the model. You'd interpret what would it look like from 90 degrees and you draw it from imagination then you go over there and you correct it and you do that until you find out there's no way to solve that without turning it into simple forms. Blocks where you swap out X and Z. Cylinders where you say let's see that is going up and it's also a little out so if I were over there it would be going up but it would be coming toward me instead of going out that takes tremendous analysis, and those of you who had headaches from yesterday, don't give it a try. You will damage yourself. Okay, I have written down some page numbers here. Might want to screen grab that. That's in the Complete Guide 5th edition. That are some really good ones to work from. Where he's doing the work for you. Bridgman, I'm not showing you that many drawings in here. Bridgman's got a lot of them in there where he's doing the work for you. And they don't all have to be blocks that are proportionally correct. Look at how that one includes the broadness of the shoulders. Look at how this one includes a made up form that we haven't even dealt with. It's not a block, it's a wedge. Okay, that's your assignment. You might say, I kind of wanted to draw beautiful figures. I kind of wanted to come in here and learn to draw like Bridgman. Well, I'm going to tell you, you do not get yourself in physical shape by getting on one of those machines that jiggles you around. The way you get in shape is you run, you lift weights, you play tug of war, you do that, all that stuff, and it isn't all pain. 
Just look these things over. Try to understand them. Draw them without too much concern for accuracy. You care more about the fact that axes and sections exist than about getting them perfect. Block and ball, cylinder and wedge, cone. Look at how he does it. There it is. Look at that line, like so. Lines go down, lines go down. I'm looking up into that box. This one's pretty much doing the same thing. There's a line like that, a line like that. Lines go down, lines go down. That means we've got our box. Oh, change the rules over here. Now we're looking down on it. There's the corner, there's the corner. Lines go across and up. That means we're looking down into it. And he'll do the same thing with every limb. This leg over here is coming toward us. And we might see a little bit of that side of it. And so we'll see a little bit of that anatomy over there. There is Bridgman teaching us how he does these rock strong drawings. There is Bridgman showing us that he's putting the two together here, essentially and saying there is the side that goes away from the light and yeah there's other parts wedging in there it's more complicated than that but he is thinking of not just the torso not just the thorax but the thorax and the pelvis wedged together maybe a little bit of a different position for that pelvis so that it goes like this and then like that, maybe. And then he says, I know that shade goes, and that makes a big, strong figure. And then you say, but what about all this stuff that got interrupted? He can put a leg onto that and cover that stuff up and put another leg behind it, and he'll work, he'll work all that stuff out later. It can't be done. Figure drawing cannot be mastered with the details if the big parts aren't working. Okay. Fill up this chart. Fill up this chart with 40, 40 figure drawings and 120 as simple boxes that you can see through. If you can turn them into something a little more organic, do. And then when you come in next Thursday, I may show some of the ones that the people are getting crit give, but if you've got people who will work with you, you will learn faster. And then we're gonna shift gears, not into technical things, not into stuff about X, Y, and Z axes and coronal, sagittal, and transverse sections, but into what the body is doing. We're gonna move into the gestural part of this. And I am now hitting the return button so that you will get a link. Go to the chat. There is a link from me to a YouTube video where I show Louis Debrat, who gave me permission to broadcast his animal analysis critique. Okay. Thank you for being here. If you're feeling lost and you feel like you need help, some of you are going to get help from me in an hour. The rest of you, I hope you've got other people that you're studying this with. You can get together and talk about it. You can share resources. You can practice together. You can give yourself feedback. And the great secret that we talked about earlier, the great secret is if you can this week, remind yourself, I get no credit for this. This is not a college course where I get to get a diploma. I'm doing this because I'm interested in it. I want to enjoy it. This is my work of choice. Everybody else is doing other things. I'm going to enjoy learning the three forms of the figure and putting them in different directions and then looking at Bridgman drawings until I have, in a matter of a week, sucked up all of the wisdom and knowledge about constructing figures of the three big forms that I can. And then we're going to move into a much more sensory, sensational, emotional 
aspect of it, of why would you place them in those positions? What's this character doing? Okay, thanks. See ya. That was session three on form from our 12 session boot camp in 2020. If you want more videos, live sessions, and updates on other offerings, subscribe to my announcement list at martialart.com. You're here to study Bridgman. This is recording four on gesture from our 2020 summer boot camp. Updates are always at martialart.com. In the spirit of stay at home, here we are in our own private cubicles. May there be joy in your cubicle. If there has not been joy in your cubicle, may there be joy in your cubicle for the next two hours. Our lessons have been cubicular and happening in your cubicle. Now, you're, you're not seeing my screen yet. Uh, let's see if this changes that. There, now you're seeing my screen. Bless Bless you for being here uh, in your and your cubicle. We are in California, South America, Russia, China, Austria, Florida, Nevada, Australia. Let us orient. The last thing we did was thickening the figure, three forms and variations. Today we are going to attempt to do poses, balance, and rhythm. We're certainly gonna do poses and balance, but I will do as, as often as possible. I will have one of these marvelous drawings in front of you to keep you busy the way you would do guitar riffs if you were a guitar student. And as far as drawings that I can put in front of you, I don't know what you think of this drawing. I think this is one of the most beautiful examples of a life drawing done by a teacher that I have ever seen. And I don't mean that like uh, done by a teacher, yeah. I mean, it just happened to be done by a teacher. If he had not been a teacher, it still would be one of the most beautiful examples of a life drawing I've ever seen, but it did nothing for me in my early 20s. I couldn't see it. I could only see scruffiness. If you are young and it does grab you, what a life you will have. If it doesn't, one thing you have to look forward to is that the more you look, the more you see. This happens even if you don't gain skills, which makes art reviewers and art critics. But if you're seeking skills, these are things you can aspire toward. Now, this drawing has a lot in it. It has, as we have studied, proportion. He probably drew it from top to bottom, aware of the height of that head, aware of the halfway point there, that if that head were up there higher, then he'd have about a halfway point there at the groin. He was certainly aware of the rib cage. Oh, in fact, let me erase and show you that uh, he was aware. Look at that peak and look at that peak, and look at how we know that he was thinking of a shape in there and that the axis 
is like that. We know that because he has told us over and over. And we know that the other shape in there is on an axis like that. But it's more than that. It's also spun with a center line over there. We know that because over here he's making a big deal of it. It's amazing also how shape just flat shapes can make something look credible. Her whole pelvic block seems about as convincing as anyone is likely to get with charcoal marks on paper to get to show, to show a strong uh, woman and the final thing is form, and that's that was the final thing we started. I want to go back to something. I want to go back to something we're going to take up today with the term gesture. Do you know that Bridgman's colleague, Nicolaides, would have told us not to start with the head? Nicolaides would have been more likely to have us start with a line like that. Many an animator would have you start with a line like that and then maybe a line not that would go from, sorry, not that would go from here to here, but that would go from here to here. Why? They might do it either way but because grounding it and then thrusting it up might be one way to do it. The other way would be to say, no, I'm gonna plant that foot down that way. But you see, that doesn't determine how this figure will look exactly. It determines how the artist is feeling about the figure, which is that the figure is grounded. People call that an action line. Let's see. Glenn Vilpu, who also starts with the head, would be likely to start with something that would be more like this way, and this way, and this way, and this way, and look for how these offset apostrophes would not get too enclosed and symmetrical so that your eye would get caught in them, as happens in symmetrical poses. That's a big part of what Vilpu teaches in gesture. Now, we studied this stuff last week. And the final thing that we did last week was to study the form. And we'll take a minute here. You can be pretty sure that this pose at the left is anatomically impossible, except for some yoga master. Now watch the screen. If you're drawing, pull away from your drawing right now to watch the screen. Why is this so hard? Because that corner of the rib cage, which we've seen is anatomical, does not connect to that corner. That's just not how it works. That corner connects to this corner. In fact, let me do that again, if it will let me. You see how this might curve that way, and then it might curve that way to make it have a little sense of form. Now watch the other one, this corner over here, that corner is not going to connect to this corner. It's going to come over here. And now we've got this front plane of this abdomen and this front plane of this chest. We've got two separate forms, one of them facing up to our left, one of them facing 
down, we see the top of it, not the bottom of it, to our right, and we have to think in our training. Maybe not by the time Bridgman was doing this, although he was thinking it while he was explaining it to students, certainly, because he was taking the time to do that diagram. Just a moment. Now we go from this corner to that corner and that corner to that corner. And with two simple forms, blocks are simple forms. We get a twisted that other one over there on the other side is going to go over to there. We wouldn't even see it. But we might, we might lift it up to there so that we pick a net. We've made a complex form out of two simple forms. Okay, that is what you've spent time understanding in the past few days. And it might have been 10 hours. It might have been 15 hours. With some of you, it might have been 20 hours of your time since I last saw you. So let's take a look and see what you did. The session was to draw 40 analyses of Bridgman bodies, reducing the three masses, head, thor thorax, and pelvis into three transparent blocks. If that was easy, try redrawing them, reducing them to organic transparent forms, spheres or eggs, think them through. And if you want an advanced task, try draw redrawing at least three. Lily Penelope dot Watson. You did the assignment, indeed. This is nicely done. I, I'm, I'm going to guess you did them with pen and ink, or you did them on paper and then scanned them in, cleaned them up, composited them. The fact that you took the time to do something like that tells us that on the front of this person's body, because it's stretching. We're going to deal with this today. That means this corner of the rib cage and this corner of the rib cage. Michelangelo loved to do this. They will look so bony, so hard, because they are. Those portions are bone. But then this part in here could actually suck in and hang down as flesh. And since we're looking up both at this block and at this block, watch this next line. We're going to talk about cross contours as we go. That tells us we're looking up at that belly. And then over here where we're going to have a muscle group called the external oblique. It's not the only thing there, but watch this. That cross contour will go around there, and then notice how it curves this way, and this red plane is facing forward, and the other red plane over there will face forward, and then it'll wrap around there. Notice how this might have an extra fold of flesh there to squash it up because it's concave on that side. That's part of why you did this. Look over here. And you'll see that the neck, if that's the front of the head, we'll find out that there is behind the ear on this side. That head to that person is facing right. To us, it's facing left. To them, they're facing right. Which means over there on the left side of their ear, there is a cord, a muscle that will go to the pit of the neck and pull tight and swing that head to look over there at that character's right. And then the other portion of that muscle will wrap around there. Now, I can't be worried about those muscles if I don't know what they're connecting from and to, which will be landmark points on bones. And even though that isn't a skull yet, at least it's a form. And it's a form that I can tell I'm looking up at which means somewhere behind that ear over there is where that's going to go. Now, that's stretched, obviously. It's contracted and, even though it's contracted, it's, uh, it's, it's spinning it around there and we'll be able to, it's pulling itself over the stuff underneath it. What about over here? 
these are going to be squashed, those belly muscles, because it changes direction there. Okay, I think that's enough to show why this was done. And you did a good job, Lily, and you also took the time to start. Everybody, turning the, what section was that? I'm gonna watch the chat out of the corner of my eye. If you wrap a line like that, like an equator line around the globe, what section is that on a sphere, on any, any form? That is the I'm transverse, several people got it. What section is the one that is the center line through the nose and lips that goes over to the other side? Anyone know that one? I'll give you a hint. It would show you the side profile. That's a sagittal section. So we got one more left, and that's the one that goes down here through the ears, and that if it were to go up over the top of the head and shine, it would look like a, that's the coronal section. Okay, good. You, you took the time to go over those terms and get them in your head. And those are the three. Those are the three sections that we'll find cross contours in. All right, thank you, Lily. Luca. Luca. Luca, you did the job. You did it exemplary, and I, 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 I assume you did not use a straight edge on any of these, right? Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, no, yeah, good. Uh, there's something I forgot to emphasize last Saturday that came up in Tuesday night's beasts class. Students trying to work out the anatomy of their fantastic animals. And one of them had just been in my animal drawing class and learned to be very meticulous about the machinery and did an understudy of the bones that showed specific planes and divisions of the pelvis in an animal that's gonna be sitting down with its legs in front of us where we wouldn't even see the pelvis. And I recognized what a bad influence this meticulous machinery, analytical machinery, let me show you what I mean. It's the stuff that we are going to be doing here. Body as machine and bones as muscles. It's really valuable. However, it's, it's valuable as a student to get familiar with the fact that it's happening. There is no need in drawing a figure or a fantastic beast to do every plane of the hidden bones, but to do simply enough to know that there would be a bump there and there would be muscles spreading out around and one that aims toward it. And if those two bumps of bone, watch my hands if you can see them, those two bumps of bone come together, they're gonna pinch flesh. And if they spread apart, they're gonna stretch flesh. And that again, over here, look at how that is going to be stretching away from there. And this is going to be pinching down into there. Look at this is more than enough to explain pretty much all you need to know about the basics of big figure form and did you carry through further to turn them into organics this is the way to start by the way because blocks are harder for most people uh, at first Dieter you were asking about foreshortening I'm going to talk about it now I'm going to take five minutes or so for and Luca good thinking. You said, I didn't turn them into organic forms. I'm really bad about blocks and cubic forms, so I decided to focus on cubes. Not necessarily cubes. Cubes are one by one by one. Those are cubes. Not a single one of these is a cube. These are blocks. Blocks is just a way to say that it's not a one by one by one cube. But I am going to talk about some foreshortening here. Your question is, how to get the length of limbs when drawing the figure in perspective when the figure is foreshortened? Let me tell you how one does it. 
One does it by knowing what the length of the limb is. For example, if we have a thorax and we have an upper arm and that upper arm goes out about two head widths from the body, the head's going to be up here. Uh, we can have that arm in many positions and these positions are fairly easy because they're not foreshortened. So what do we do when something, let's, let's work a little bigger here, let's treat the bone as the simplest thing we can. Let's say that represents an upper arm. What about when that comes directly toward us? Well, if we were to see the end of a cylinder, we would see that it would look like that. We can't even tell it's a cylinder. Ortho means straight on, and it tells us this is how long it really is. Now watch what I do. I'm going to put a rubber band on there that from the side looks just like that. And if I were to draw, let's draw this. I'll go really light with my line, and I'm going to draw it several times to make this point. Let's do any one of these shapes is going to be a foreshortened arm. That's going to be the hardest one because that one's so barely foreshortened. Now I'm going to thicken up my line a little bit, and we're going to do what we did the other day, but with a difference. It's very easy to say that this end is closer to me than that end and wrap a rubber band like that because that rubber band, which should be a circle in perspective, will help me to know that this end is closer. But that looks too long for an arm coming toward me with an opening like that. So I might say that if that arm as a block is coming toward me, I might want to make it a little bit shorter than that. And that's now starting to be credible as a block. What about this one? What if this end were closer to me? I could do this thing. It's very easy to just wrap a rubber band around it. That gets me started. And then find a corner, snap these rubber bands tight, and I've got a form that is more coming toward me now. That's closer to a circle than it was. Let's do this one that I said was going to be hard because it's so long. It's barely coming toward us, just that little sliver over there. So the rubber band, the rubber band will just be barely curved like that, and we'll see an end, something like that. And if we're looking down on it, now we have got the potential for a block that is quite non or short. The closer it gets to one end coming toward us, Dieter, when you're just working with a sausage, the more open the ellipse, the more curved the rubber band, and the shorter the form. Now, I hope that made sense. There is a way to do it. Did we talk about the use of a thick pencil in front of you to do this? Uh, Sarah, you're asking, how do you decide if you need to cut the ends off or not by eye? Yes. Can you imagine if in figure drawing, if you were to get out your T-square and triangle and do a plan projection from an ortho and then figure out, I'll go from here to here and then project all these lines. How would you ever do a figure drawing? But by practicing, you start to see that something looks too open. Now, here is a way to train your eye, or here's a way to cheat. Let's just cheat. There's a, a kind of pencil that I like. I like these pilots. And if I'm holding this thing, let's get it so you can see it, right up to myself, level with my eye, this will have horizontal lines across it. You could put little rubber bands around it. And if you tip it toward yourself, Look at what will happen if that eraser is a nice flat eraser. You'll start to see the top of it. Eventually, it will come right toward you and become a circle. 
and the op and look, you can't see the length of the, the pencil now. And the opposite will happen in the other direction, that if you tip it away from you, it will start to disappear around to the other side. And that is a way to sit in front of a model if you're working from a model or look at a photograph and hold your pin in the position that will make that clear. Did that make sense, Sarah? I seriously love your explanation. I've always had trouble with fortune. And this 10 minute demonstration taught me more than the countless tutorial videos I watched on the subject. It makes so much sense. Okay, good. Good. What we're trying to do is point toward the, the reality that a human limb and a human body are uh, three-dimensional entities. And they're complex three-dimensional entities. Let's go back to sharing screen. They are complex three-dimensional entities. And because they are complex, we must, in order to draw them with control, in order to be able to tip them around, we must simplify. You cannot look at a hand like that and then suddenly turn it around in these different positions if you're thinking about every detail. And yet, and yet your subconscious mind does it every night when you dream. You do incredible imagining of that. But that's the quote we started this term with, this, uh, this month with, was, which is that the subconscious mind must take care of a great deal. Therefore, learning to draw means acquainting the subconscious mind with a good deal while we draw, uh, while we learn, and then the subconscious can take over. Okay, I hope that helped. Dieter, here is a way that you can find in Bern Hogarth's book that can be uh, useful, and many other teachers have shown it also. And that is, can you, if you are trying to draw a limb, let's say you're trying to draw a foreshortened leg. I can't draw a foreshortened leg. Yeah, but I could draw a leg from the side, and I could pretend like it's... Uh, like I'm, I'm going to be over here at the right looking this way, and I could run a line. Let's go to the line tool and see if we can do this. Let's run a line horizontally over there and run a line horizontally over here. And run, uh, oh, this is a tough one because see, this is where we're going to have the information we need. We need to run that line over there and run this line over here. And what have we got? We've got some markers that will allow us to watch what I do. I, however, that upper leg is going to be, that upper leg, the top of it is going to have to land right there. And the knee is going to be. Well, that knee is going to be stretched out into here. And then what about the ilio, or the, excuse me, the nose of the tibia? That's going to be there. Where's the ankle going to be? Let's do it a little bit more like this. That ankle is going to go back there, and it's going to have to all fit into there. Do you see that? And then that heel of the foot will be up there, and it will come down there like that, and the toe will be like that. So there is a way in answer to your question, there is a way to do it from the side and know that if you spin it on a lazy Susan, the thing that was this long, watch this, watch this, the thing that was this long becomes this long. Did that help? Did it make sense? Uh, wow, and crystal clear here, that second demo was also very helpful. Okay, these, these were useful things to stop. And, uh, and deal with. I think that this is from one view, and then if you were to walk around that person from the back, is that what we're looking at? Yes, okay. All right, everybody. Did any of, I wonder how many of you tried, uh, tried right angle studies. The first time we ever did a right angle study, 
When you do it from a live model in a room where you're close to the stage and perspective affects how their feet are on the ground and the foot that's closer to you is lower in the ground plane, and then you try to imagine how that's going to be in 90 degrees. I don't know that I'm going to take much time with it now because I think I would do it clunkily, but I may. Let me make a note that we would take time to do a 90 degree study tomorrow as a demo. Let me just show quickly here as an insert what I meant. This is close to the model. The closer you get, the more you exaggerate perspective problems. Case in point, left foot forward and lower, left foot still forward and lower, left foot forward and higher, left foot higher, left foot lower. It moves up and down in your vision because it's below us moving away on a level surface up to the horizon. You know that only if you know perspective. If not, don't worry too much about it now. It gets involved. But let me tell you, if you want to try it, if you are working on it, there are a couple of tricks. One is the slow motion analytical way, which is that you say the chest compared to a vertical line, the chest is angled back. So that means whichever position I'm in, if I'm behind the thing, if I'm behind that body, the chest will be angled back. The head is angled down. So if I'm behind that body, let me quickly show you what I mean when I say behind that body. That person's going to be in a position like this, say, where we're, they're not facing toward us. That head is angled down from a vertical line. And since we're in front of it, we see the top of it. But since we're behind it, we would not see the top of it. We'd see a little bit underneath it, like so. And those hips, those hips are angled back in the opposite way of the chest. And so I'm going to have them in a position like this. I'm in front of them looking down on them. I'm behind them looking up at those hips. So look what I do. I make a little cylinder like that, and then I try to turn it into something box-like. And that will let me know that I'm going to look up at those hindquarters. And then all the other stuff. This, because it's compressed, will pinch. This, because it's extended, will, will uh, stretch. Uh, but the first thing is to simply name whether something's looking up or down, and then a little further. If this person, if this person, if, the, if this is the front of their face, that's one thing. If this is the front of their face, that's another thing. And we could say the front of their face is looking to their right. The head is angled down, and they're looking to their right, which means they aren't looking that way. They may be looking that way. I think they're looking that way. Well, that means we're going to do something different than what I did here. We're going to look up at that head, and we're going to have them slightly looking that is, one ear will be there, the other ear will be there, the back of the head will be there, and their nose will be over there, and they'll be looking that way. This is by naming aspect. That's the long position of anything. How something's tipped. And direction, or it's technically called yaw. Hey, I am going to spin. I, I am going to spend uh, a couple minutes here because we didn't do this last week and it had to do, we ran out of time. Pitch, yaw, and roll. Do any of you know what that means? If you do, you can just brag in there. I know what it means. You know it if you fly airplanes. Um, I'm going to clear my drawings and start over. Pitch is when you have a cylinder lying on the ground with a vertical line going through it 
and when it faces toward you or it faces to your left or extremely to your left or to your right. And I know I'm doing these roughly, but you can see, even though I'm doing them roughly, I can kind of see through there where they're coming through. That comes from doing a lot of slow motion stuff. And the way, I'm sorry, that's not pitch, that's yaw. That's yaw. Yeah. That is, yaw is spinning on the y-axis. Y. Pitch is spinning on X. Here's what that means. If you've got a cylinder in a position like this, and you've got a spool that goes, a, a center that goes through there like that, things might face up. They might go away from us a little bit like that. They may come toward us like this. They may aim down. They may aim straight down. They can be in all sorts of positions as they go in the sagittal plane, movement in the sagittal plane. Is that the sagittal section or the sagittal plane? Spinning on Y is on the, uh, in the transverse plane. We got one more to go. What is it? It's that uh, if we were to take this right here and say, I now want to make things go around this way, that would be spinning on the Z axis, and that's called roll. Roll spins on Z in the coronal plane. Now again, you can find this in many books. If you are a 3D animator, if you're any kind of animator, you already know about this stuff because it's just so, it's, you, you can hardly do 3D animation. I can't imagine you doing 3D animation and actually moving things around with habit, having to have dealt with those terms, but it's a different thing to draw this and to be, to be able to say about every one of these cylinders that it is slightly coming toward me or starting to go away from me. Those are the three kinds of movement. Now, why did I go on this aside? I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be putting, I, I'm going to move on in just a moment because I know that we're, we're, that was quite a long aside. I hope it was useful to you. Why? Why would we deal with airplane controls? Why would we deal with, deal with remote controls for movement in a Bridgman boot camp? Because this is one of the ways you figure out how to do a 90-degree study. By naming the position of this that it is pitched down that it is yawed to the left, and even by a certain number of degrees. And it also may be tipped. It may be, the head may be, watch this, if that's the front view, that head may be tipped to the side this way, or tipped to the other side that way, and that change of aspect side to side as well as front to back, and then spun left to right to take the time in a 90 degree angle study and relate these all to a perfect vertical. That's one way to do it. Another is to swap out your X and Z lines. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Brendan, Brendan, you did the work and you miss spelled Bridgman's name. I was so impressed with you for a few moments there. I'm going to forgive you, but third time, punishments. Okay, this is to show you, folks.
This is to show you that people around the world, along with you, are doing this. Phoenix, this is quite incredible. And this is not with a 3D program. It is digital. I assume it's with Photoshop or you do something else. Uh, each column corresponds to the topmost drawing, rotating the angle, then tilting down and up. Although plenty of boxes came out distorted or changed shape between drawings, I feel that I got a far better sense of what looks right by the end. Phoenix! You did it! This was work, and this, this wide-angle lens stuff is great. Now, you mentioned the proportions. The proportions go weird. I want to give you permission about proportions. This is going to sound a little lackadaisical for a boot camp, but we know that a head is not proportioned that way. A head is quite proportioned this way. We know that this one is too squat, and this one is too flattened. However, you at least worked out these line system, and, and that is rehearsing one of the things that Robert Beverly Hale made such a big deal out of. It's rehearsing one of those things, that every form has its own horizon line, as people keep asking about, its own vanishing points, as people could ask. Even though you're not really putting that vanishing point in there, you're just saying, I'm looking down at that head, and I see the top. There it is. I'm looking up at this head, and I see the bottom. There it is. That's, instead of putting a horizon line in there, that does it. And I see this side of that, and I can put a line on there, and look, I've got a three-planed thing like a box. Okay, enough about form. I'm going to pause for a moment. That was what we studied on Saturday. And then I turned you loose, and you spent three to four days working on it, and the fruits of your work are in front of us. I hope it was encouraging. Even if you didn't do them, to see how other all of these examples are so oppressive, my brain is trying hard to decipher it. Sarah, if it takes a long time, it's doable, and... If you get the idea, I've got to know it like Scott Robertson knows cutaways of machines. You don't need to know it that well. But you do need to know it well enough to give some thickness to the form. Katarina, the best way to practice pitch, yaw, and roll is to do those uh, little diagrams like I, I, I explained there. A cylinder this way, that's on the y-axis. Try drawing it and putting little things in it that are pointing each way, a cylinder this way, that's on the x-axis, it pitches forward, and try putting little spikes in it that go around, and a cylinder this way that goes that way, and you have to uh, give it, you can't make it completely foreshortened, or it's just a shape mechanism, and that's advanced. That's advanced. Jonathan, Brett Schneider, you are asking a legitimate question. When are we gonna talk about pose balance, and rhythm. Jonathan Brett Schneider, here we go. Okay, this was useful to some of you. All right, let's go back to one of my favorite drawings. Right back to this favorite trio of drawings, and let's take this figure, the one in the center, and I have a question for you. This is about balance. It's a yes or no question. It may be a trick question. You're going to help me. Is this figure in the center balanced? No. So I say some. Nobody's saying yes. Somebody's saying yes. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If this center in the figure, if that toe is not touching the ground, and it isn't, it isn't going to attempt to touch the ground and maybe push down a little bit, what will happen with this figure if they are not going to touch that toe to the ground? Tell me. I'm interested to know. It will fall over to our left. Why? Because 
We've got a leg over here under this pivot point. We've got an arm presumably stuck out there. We've got this arm, instead of throwing out that way to counterbalance it, and so you could say this figure is not balanced. And so if you get the idea that a figure must be balanced, it's a wrong impression. But if a figure isn't balanced, it's probably in motion. Falling? Rising, and if it doesn't continue, it would fall back rising too fast and then going over the center and falling on the other in the other direction and if you never gave any thought to this before today that's what you're going to give thought to for the better part of the next hour and for the the next uh, 20 hours you're going to be putting some energy into this if you haven't given this thought about figures you have given it plenty of feeling. A good deal of your early childhood with the grown-ups standing around cheering for you was related to getting a grip on this balance thing. When you watch great classic animation, animation from the 1930s and 40s in particular, you know that those animators were very in touch with where weight was. Now, this is going to move from a great drawing by Bridgman to something that you can do in a matter of a few, uh, in a matter of a minute. In fact, if you've got your sketchbook there, you might want to do this. You know by now how to put a mark at the top and put a mark at the bottom and find the halfway point and get an egg in there and get a pelvis in there and find these halfway down and get a head in there. And this guy moved his head a little to his left, a little to our right, but he's essentially standing there still. If he were to take this arm, his right arm, and throw it over to the right, let's say he throws it over to the right like this, what other thing might happen? As you draw it, you may be able to feel it out I can tell you, if you were to stand up and physically do it, you'd do it. It's a survival thing. He'd throw his right foot out. My goodness, that happens instinctively. And when, when it happens on a real human, on a real one and a half year old, well, maybe on a one and a half year old, I'm wrong. On a grown up, it is not thought through. I have thrown my right arm to my left, there will, or I will throw my right leg to my back. It doesn't go on, it goes in your, on in your subconscious. Could you imagine being a drafts person of such skill that when you drew an arm that extended one way, you would know to put this this way to keep balance. If you do get to that level, that's valuable to have. And that's part of what you work on right now and through the day. Is that the only possibility? What if, what if he were to throw his arm even further out? Is there another thing he might do? We're looking at all the options for what a human body can do in keeping from falling over. Uh, well, he could go on one leg, yes. He could figure that my body is going to be on this right leg and I'm gonna throw that way out while I throw this arm way over there. And he's going to try to make it the weight over there and the weight over here, two arms, one leg, I think, that I'm balanced. That's one possibility, yeah. But I'm trying to get you to think of more than one possibility. It could just more and more extreme. If you stand up and stretch your right right leg, okay, I watch this, watch this, watch this. Uh, you could do this. Now, if you are working this out on paper, the options might not occur to you. But tonight, I'm not gonna do it right now in class because we're the better part of an hour in. Tonight, 
You'll want to get on your feet and strike some of these poses in Bridgman's book or any of the other resources you have. And you may want to see what it feels like. And here's a hint about doing this. If I stayed in this position long, what would start to hurt? If I stayed in this position long, what would drive me crazy? Pose. Poses evolved in art. I've never made a study of Egyptian poses. Robert Beverly Hale has referred to them. I've heard people talk about how they choose, they chose the most characteristic position to be able to quickly recognize it, and they put them together without any concern for anatomical uh, verisimilitude, where it's, it looks like it's really a figure. It was more icons, like you design letter forms to make them easily read. But when you get to Greek sculpture, and I'm talking archaic period, I'm talking 2,600 years ago, they did sculptures of figures, a lot of male figures. I think they were called Kouros, K-O-U-R-O-S. But this was the earliest pose. It was symmetrical, vertical, standing at attention. Why would they choose a pose like that? It's strong. It says, here I stand as a pillar. If you bring these feet out like this, that makes it stronger left to right. I can be not knocked out left to right. If you put one of those feet back and the other one forward, it says it's gonna be hard to knock me over from behind, but they weren't thinking that way yet. It took time. So strong, so steady, so strong and so steady and so strong and so steady that at some point, if you're feeling their feelings, you'll start to feel, can't, can't I just shift my weight here a bit? You know this happens when you stand at long lines at Disneyland. You cannot stand at attention. You'll shift to one side and shift to another. The Greeks, a few hundred years later, started to see, hey, let's make these things look more, we use the term, naturalistic, like real people stand. Now what have we got? We have got weight on the model's left leg. Bridgman's aware of that. How did he get there? He did the things that you're going to do between now and tomorrow to give it attention, to stand in that pose, to look at this pose and connect with the model. If you seek a character of flesh and blood, as N.C. Wyeth talked about his characters uh, in illustrating characters from stories, not mannequins. You can pose a mannequin. But a character of flesh and blood and nerves that knows what it feels like to fall over will adjust their body. How does it happen? The first step is that the artist has to be aware of it. Now, I'm going to switch from this picture to a list of traits that we experience as humans in bodies of flesh and blood. This is a contraposto, yes. Counter positions. They go like this. Watch this, watch this. If you've got, I'm gonna make a thicker line. If you got the weight on that leg and the hips drop down, Bridgman knows that. Well, if they drop down and this leg is straight, doesn't this one need to fold a little? Ooh, watch that. It's a little bit foreshortened. Why? Because if it were fully straight, it would be long and we need a little extra 
Uh, it's down lower already, so we need to fold it a little. Okay. How does that have to be counteracted? Well, it's a good chance, not necessarily, but if the person's balanced, the line of the, sh the uh, corners of the rib cage will be at a counter position to that. What about the head? The head very well may do the other thing. Okay, I'm going to move on in a moment. There you go. It's pretty much the same figure, too. Can you tell that he was, he might have been doing a demo saying, what if I were over on the other side of the room? Not a 90 degree study in that case. It looks like about a 170, 160, 170 degree study where he got around to the other side. Uh, no, it's a little different, but it's not meticulous. He's thinking of the box, he's not going. Now, we're back to this issue of what bodies experience. Here's the first thing physical forces, and the first physical force we've talked about is gravity. I'm going to take two minutes to talk about gravity. Weight. It's such a big deal. I didn't used to think it was that much of a big deal until I got older. Lots of kids don't give gravity much thought because they climb all over things, but they have falls, and they find out that gravity is a big deal. And one little aside here. I know of a guy who took a class in outer space, the phenomena of being an astronaut in outer space. One of the things they found out is that no matter what exercise equipment you give these people who spend months or a year in outer space, there is no exercise that will overcome what we need. Our bodies are, are in this state, meant to be on Earth, where gravity pulls us down. And if it doesn't, there's something missing that if we are going to rise, we on this planet must rise against gravity. Apparently that is more valuable than we are aware of in any moment. But this is the hour. And this is the next 20 hours to give it some thought because it has everything to do with pose. Well, are there other forces? Yes, there's another force that is exactly like gravity, except that it doesn't pull down. Wind. If you're underwater, water currents. Someone pulling or pushing. Actually, someone pulling would be more like gravity. What's another physical force? Pressure. Well, what's that mean? Anything that tugs anything that pinches, if you say that part compresses and harden those lines and put extra flesh in there and that part stretches, it extends, that is a force, a physical force. Bridgman makes an accordion. You've seen it in the book. He puts a rib cage like that and a pelvis like that and he says, there's the side where the extra parts of the accordion pinch in, and here's the part where they stretch out. That's another set of physical forces that affects pose. Here's a big one, motion. Now, Bridgman's book, Bridgman's books, 1920 through 1940-ish. In one of the early ones, he writes this. The continuous slow motion picture has given us a new appreciation of rhythm in all visible movement. In pictures of pole vault or steeplechase, we actually may follow with the eye the movement of every muscle and note its harmonious relationship to the, in relation to the entire action of the man or the horse. Now I'm ahead. I jumped ahead to rhythm. And we're going to extend rhythm into tomorrow's session. Rhythm's a big deal. And I, I want to mention something. Rhythm can be confusing when you read it in these books because he is talking about more than one kind of rhythm. 
balance can be confusing because he is talking about more than one kind of balance. I will clarify the balance thing in the next half hour and I will maybe clarify the rhythm thing. But we have to, this is why, this is why you're taking a class in Bridgman's book. On the first day, when I was explaining how confused I was when he said that this part was round, do you remember how he said it, don't look round? What he meant is that in cross section, the transverse section of that is fairly round. The transverse section of the knee is fairly square. And the transverse section of the lower leg is quite triangular. But he never said that in the description. He just said the thigh is round, the knee is square, and the lower leg is triangular. We're going to have the same problem with these words of rhythm and balance. I will deal with it. But let's, he's jumping ahead, to, I'm jumping ahead to rhythm. Watch this. What is this slow motion picture? Well, remember, film was new in the early 20th century. In the late 19th century, look at those dates. Thomas Aikens in the United States was doing these experiments with athletes and film. And as primitive as that seems to you by today's comparisons with color photography, full 4K video on your smartphone, can you imagine how incredible that was to people then to document human motion? This is a guy throwing a punch. This is Edward Mybridge. I'm going to tell you about him. I mean, the, uh, the photographer is Edward Mybridge. I'll get back to this one. This is one of the great innovations in human perception to use photography in its early stages to scientifically prove what happens in that movement that we could not have known previous to. Now, let's get back to Bridgman and balance. He says, the faster a person moves, the more extreme they throw themselves out of balance. That the pendulum, if it's just making a little arc like that, might be kind of tired. But if it's swinging all the way over to there, it's going to have to rebound and motion we're not just talking about balance now. We're talking about motion. The faster a person moves, the more extreme they throw themselves out of balance. And this pendulum swinging might confuse you. It did me until just the last week or so where I spent some time with it. This I understand. It's static. He's not moving. This, when I see an angle like this, it makes me say, how come I don't see an angle like that? But the reason why is that this guy has his pivot point. Fulcrum is down on the ground. This has it above. So this is swinging over to the right, and this is swinging over to the right. Okay, I get it. But I want you to see that the metaphors for movement are particularly important, not with a clock pendulum, but with just the awareness of fixed points, pivot points, and moving points. Everybody knows that we have a joint in the hip right here. We're going to find that that great trochanter of the femur and the ball and socket joint that's just barely in there will come down and make a an upper leg bone and then there'll be condyles on there and we know that that can swing it can't swing very far back actually you end up having to move the pelvis to get it far back but it'll swing way up and how does it swing 
it swings as an arc from that ball and socket joint. Well, the whole leg, the whole leg could do that. And when you study anatomy, you're aware of that. But I think what most people don't pay attention to until they animate is that the more important fulcrum is the one on the ground. Because this foot, when it's locked to the ground, is truly on the ground, stuck. And so that foot has been there since it planted itself down. And now watch, watch this. And it has arced over to a position like that to where it can't stand it anymore. And then it's going to swing this foot forward to land over there, lift this one up, and go back and forth like that. Now, let's take a look at Edward Mybridge's photographs of this happening. You see, this guy's leg will swing from the perfect side view, it would make almost a perfect circle. It will swing from that pivot point. But watch what happens when he swings this leg forward and makes it touch the ground and it contacts the ground and then we will have this hip make an arc. It will get higher and lower around that pivot point. The upside down pendulum that is part of movement. The metaphor for this guy, for this foot, is like a spoke in a wheel, right? That's on the ground. That was on the ground. It will be on the ground later. And it just sort of goes like, like uh, the four legs of a horse, which look like a spoke in a wheel. Now, of course, this is going to move. It's going to swing from that pivot point over on the other side, but it's not going to go in a circle because a knee bends, and so they'll probably bring it more like in a French curve over to where it needs to be. Uh, now, I know I'm spending a lot of time in this course on explaining something that animators take for granted. If you're an animator, I'm sorry to have taken you back to uh, step one. Um, but it, it relates to your homework. The guy at our left, what can we deduce about this? You know, we have to assume that he is in motion and not just standing in a power pose. You see, this could be a power pose. Not moving, just letting you know that, that he's strong. But granted that he is moving, and we're assuming he's moving forward, what's he gonna have to do? Well, this leg's gonna stay on the ground. That's planted, which means we know that that's going to make an arc that way. What else is gonna have to happen? If he's moving forward, this is trailing behind. Boy, that's the baggage, that's the caboose. We've gotta lift it up, and we've gotta swing it forward. And these double arcs that happen when animators draw, they actually draw out the arcs. And Tomorrow, not today's, but tomorrow's project for Saturday will be to do some of Kimo Nicolaiti's potential poses where you take a pose and then you say, what could happen next from that? And there's nothing that's going to make it easier for you than someone who's in motion because this guy doesn't want to fall down on his head. It hurts. So he's gonna have an impulse to pull some muscles in that hip and swing that leg over. Actually, it'll be quite a bit further forward than what I'm doing. And catch himself. And then when this one is trailing back, he'll kick it off the ground and swing it forward. And those series of multiple arcs, even if you're not an animator, what is the quote that I gave you 
from Bridgman, it was the continuous slow motion picture has given us a new appreciation of rhythm in all visible movement. Movies of the Paul Walter steeplechase we may actually follow with the eye the movement of every muscle and its harmonious relation to the entire action of the man of the age. Now, if you want to pursue this further, we spent about 10, 15 minutes on my bridge and Eek Aikens. If you want to pursue it further, this is the classic source. I never tire of it don't need it. You can learn this from video better if these books are too expensive. Let me tell you another, this is an aside, but this is interesting. When these books came out, they were not printed as books. They didn't have offset lithography back then. You couldn't pay 20 bucks for a book like this because they had to be done in the dark room. A book was actually done from plates. And in the process of that, it was so much work that I'm told the price of a full collection was about the price of a house. That means rich artists like Degas could have a set. Other artists could still have a few plates. I have one of the horse, one of the human male running, one of the human female running, one of the child, and that was their study. My gosh. Well, Dover reprinted 60 of their best and then later came out with them as the uh, CD-ROM version. Now, to finish up the Mybridge stuff, a few good animation teachers. To learn those basics enough to where you can look at any still photo, and tell two things. What happened just before that position? And what happened either uh, after or could have happened after? And then you're gonna get at what George Bridgman gets at in his two paragraphs on balance. He only has two paragraphs in the whole collection of books, two paragraphs on balance. You will get at that with some lessons from animators which they did not have access to in 1920. Let's finish it this way. People move by throwing themselves out of balance and catching themselves. Pivoting, repeating the procedure, artists who notice these lines can bring rhythm to their drawing. They can make a drawing look nice by comparison to an artist who does not even sense that that rhythm is there. Now, that was a long time on motion, but it was in response to Bridgman. I'm gonna make another point about motion and I'm gonna go faster. What did the animators give us? One thing they gave us is the awareness of drag and follow through. When a naked body runs or walks, you don't notice it that much. But when a body has hair, and it is moving fast, you will notice something that if it's moving this direction, the hair might go back like that. It may have been starting like this with the hair straight down. But when it moves forward, hair and drapery and beads of sweat will not be able to move as fast as the primary form. That's useful for animators. That's useful for any artists. What's follow through? Follow through is that if somebody is running and they suddenly stop, that is, their body suddenly stops as they put their foot out 
and they're going to stop, that hair will keep going and those beads of sweat will keep going and those sleeves and that clothing will continue to go forth. Those two phenomena, that when the body moves, the hair, the clothing, or the little kid who's not going willingly will hold back and delay. The opposite is that we move, we stop too fast, the cherries go flying. Sometimes when a thing stops, the movable stuff on it, like sweat beads and the fruit you're carrying, keep going. Now, when you look at comic book artists, speed lines are graphic depictions of drag. They don't have to be accurate, but aren't they exciting? And when you are looking at even those old photographs, Let me ask you, without looking at the numbers, which I don't even think you can see the numbers anyway, I didn't necessarily put these in left to right first. Which, which of these two drawings comes first? This one or this one? There's a way to know. Is she moving the can forward or back? Ah, she went from here to here and we know this because the spray of the water drags. Woo! We have got something that a child may be able to figure it out. Grown-ups sometimes don't because they're saying, uh, gosh, what year was that photograph taken? They didn't work on film back then. They worked on glass plates. Oh, it's black and white. Huh. I'm supposed to learn anatomy. There's a vertical line in there somewhere. You could, and uh, tomorrow and uh, into Saturday, you may look at something like this and say, that might be a perfectly still moment. What a dangerous idea. But you see, if that was thrusting, that if there were streamers on it, they'd go like that. But if he were pulling back, in the opposite direction, the if he was to pull back that way, then it might leave some things there. This is that's actually amazingly uh, a, 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 apparently a still picture. If my bridge were to tug on this guy's hand so that he has to lean forward and then he'd have to put more pressure there to keep from falling over, and then maybe throw that leg out there to keep from falling over. That would be one set of dynamics. Dynamics are how things change. But if he, the stronger man, and by the way, the guy on the right is my bridge. If this guy were to pull on my bridge's hand, can you see how hard it would be since my bridge is standing with these legs together? He's apparently not an athlete. Well, he was pretty athletic but he also seems a little sheepish about this guy. He's in a position where it'd be easy to pull him over. And the first thing he'd do is throw that leg out to counterbalance, maybe throw that arm out to counterbalance. Ah, interesting thing. Sarah said, oh, I was looking at legs, didn't even think of the water. Sarah, that strong man, this guy, He's throwing a punch. Watch this. He threw that punch, and now he pulls it back. And if we go the other way, that's the end of his cycle. You have to pay close attention to this. If you loop it backward, it looks wrong because it is wrong. This is very sophisticated. But when he throws this punch, there are muscles, the serratus anterior right there, and the pectoralis that are going to pull the humerus and the scapula behind it forward. Watch this. When we go like that, muscles are doing that. He's also pulling on his tricep to straighten that arm 
and he's pulled it as straight as he can pull it, and he's continuing. Look at how that shoulder blade has gone around there. It's being pulled by muscles we can't see, and then it makes contact. And then when he wants to pull it back, he's going to use the latissimus dorsi and that one underneath there, the teres major. This is the stuff physical therapists know. Watch this. He's going to use that to pull it back. But if you were to go in the backward direction, you even though he has no clothing on him, that would make it, if he, if he had drapery on him, it would be really obvious that it's running backward. But watch, this, watch the screen. You can tell it was run backward. How can you tell it was run backward? The wrong muscles are pulling and the rhythm of the arc of his arm. It doesn't make sense. It looks nice, but it doesn't make sense. That makes sense. This doesn't make sense. And how would you know that? Well, I could tell, but I could tell on a subconscious level. But that's part of why I'm in here eager to be studying Bridgman along with you is that Bridgman emphasizes this to know what the figure is doing all right let's go back to what we're doing we are noticing weight we are noticing wind we are noticing drag and follow through and all of these things are the physical world of forces that an artist can use to make it feel like a physical world of forces in there. But how can an artist use these things if an artist hasn't spent a good deal of hours and maybe a few months noticing those things consciously so that later the subconscious mind can take them over? I have to move on. Here is a whole other category, an internal, an internal physical force that we experience because we have bodies, and it's a thing we all know in the real world, and it's emotion. Your posture this week and the way that you moved was affected by things going on in your feelings. Everyone's body reflects how they feel or don't. Unless we make an effort to hide those feelings. And we usually make an effort not to show those feelings physically because the emotions might be a problem. We're trying hard not to smile. We're trying to look like we're happy when we're not. Uh, tremendous influence on a body but it's a whole other area very important in storytelling staging and acting and character development it's it's core it's the core thing in staging and acting but there's no time for it here however there's a teacher from the same time as Bridgman who the bulk of his teaching is about all of these forces physical emotional uh, ex, uh, external and internal, all of them collectively. What teacher am I referring to? I watched the chat. Nicolaides. This is the book which everyone has an opinion about, including not having an opinion. I have an opinion, but it, it's not a simple opinion, so it just confuses some people. I don't want to confuse you. I want to clarify, so let me say this. Here's a fact about Nicolaides' book, as far as I know. I'm telling you the best I know. No book that I know puts more energy into getting you, the artist, to pay attention to the model as a swirl of molecules affected by physical forces, including their own weight related to gravity and emotion and maybe even invisible forces beyond. I'm not saying that this book does it the best. I'm saying it does it the most. If you know another book that does it more or better, tell me. I would team it up with Don Richardson's Acting Without Agony, which is a whole different actors and directors approach. We've talked about pose and balance. 
a little bit about rhythm. I turn them into three words. Pose is the position. Balance starts to have to do, have to do with motion, physical forces, gravity pulling you down. You can fall one way or another. Rhythm, we haven't developed it. But before we do, I think that instead of using these three terms, we could just use one term. Those of you who know Nicolaides, what would be the one term that would count for all three of those? Ah, uh, Millicent says, I don't know how to read this, but yeah, gesture. For several years, every art teacher whose work or whose students I admired, I asked them how they taught gesture. I got quite a few different answers, but most of them were short studies. Short studies, 30 seconds, a minute, not more than two minutes, where you have to get the whole figure drawn during that short study. Now, there was more to it than that. Many people said more than that, but that I'm telling you what they all had in common. Short, don't stop, or at least don't stop for long, and complete the whole figure. Some would add straight and curved lines. Some would appeal to metaphors, like put the lines down as if you're skiing. Let, let the lines flow through the figure like a school of fish, where they go in one direction and then they suddenly dart and change another and a uh, dart. Uh, put the lines down like a roller coaster. But what they all had in common is that they should not be long studies. What does Chemo Nicolaides teach in this book? I, this week, I went through the book and I put together three pages of his comments on gesture. I want to show you one page. And this is exercise number two after the contour drawing. In quick studies, Nicolaides is the one who invented this term gesture. He's, or he's the one who coined it. Uh, in quick studies, you will consider the function of action, life, or expression. Wow, those are big abstract terms. I call it gesture. In the first five seconds, you should put something down that indicates every part of the body in the pose. Gosh, five seconds, that's hard. Remind yourself of this once in a while by limiting a group of gesture studies to five or 10 seconds each. Really? Yeah, I'm trying to remind you. If it's gonna be gestural, you don't wanna think it too much through. As the pencil roams, it will sometimes strike the edge of the form, but more often it will travel through the center of forms and often it will run outside the figure, even out of the paper altogether. Do not hinder it, let it move at will. Above all, do not slow down and start to meticulously analyze edges. Now, he says many other things. Gesture is movement in space. Here is the deal that has to do with your homework. To be able to see the gesture, you must be able to feel it in your own body. You should feel that you are doing whatever the model is doing. If you do not feel as the model feels, your drawing is only a map or a plan. He says again, in a gesture drawing, you feel the movement of the whole form in your whole body. The focus should be on the entire figure and you should keep the whole thing going at once. Try to feel the entire thing as a unit, a unit of energy, a unit of movement. He said that students ask him, how should we be thinking of the figure? He said, my response is that you should not be thinking of the figure. Rely on sensation rather than thought. Sarah, when you draw and you do these half minute, minute studies, simply respond with your muscles to what the model is doing and let your pencil record that response automatically without thinking. Loosen up, relax. Here's a big secret of creativity. Malcolm Gladwell well, wrote an entire book called Blink, which is a worthwhile book. Most of the time, your instinct will guide you. 
sometimes guide you the better if you can learn to let it act swiftly in a blink and directly without paralysis by analysis. What does he end this with? The study of gesture is not simply a matter of looking at the movement that the model makes and analyzing it and saying pitch, yaw, and roll and doing the stuff that gave Sarah a headache. You must also seek to understand the impulse that exists within the model and causes the pose which you see to not break my head, to step back a safe distance from that naked man, to let him know that I'm stronger than him, to water that area as opposed to this area, and to do it quickly because I'm running out of water, to get into the feelings of the character, to know that this guy is pouring himself into punching and once he's done the punch to pull it back and to have his legs spread from forward to backward so that when he throws himself out of balance, he doesn't fall over. Look at the, the way that leg grips. That's a leg where the muscles are tensed. This is a leg where the muscles are relaxed. Corey Finger, this reminds me of how animators act out their animations in person in D. That's your job tonight. Possess a, present it with you this often too. Stand in the pose, do the motion, act it out to feel the tensions and flexing of things. The first person, the first student of mine who did this so consciously was Justin Sweet. When he would do a warrior, he would get into that warrior's position and get up into that position multiple times to see what it was like until he knew that position. And you see other people, Frazetta would do it too, but you see other people who will do superpower characters that look like mannequins. They look like they've been placed in that position and they don't feel strong because there's no empathy. Even if you copy a photograph and copy it exactly, you may be stuck with a photograph that wasn't the best position to show the feeling you're trying to get expressively. Now, I want to give you a little hint why people don't, why people get confused. Draw not what the thing looks like, but what it is doing. Yeah, you made that point over and over, Kimon. And he's talked about gesture as action, gesture as movement. By gesture, we do not mean simply movement or motion or action. A thing does not have to be in motion to have gesture. You see for it when the model is relaxed just as much in a very active pose. Gesture cannot be understood by reading my book. To discover it, there is required only practice and awareness on your part. You learn about it more from drawing than from anything I can say. It is, f look, look at the last pitch. I'm going to move away from everything Nicolaiti says about gesture in just a minute. It is far more important that your studies contain this comprehension of movement of gesture than that they contain any other single thing. Really? Are you that dogmatic about it? Yeah. That's how dogmatic Nicolaides is. Might throw some people off. Don't paint the sleeve, paint the action of the fist. It doesn't apply to everybody. Kimon, uh, or excuse me, Lion Decker does not paint the action of the fist. Lion Decker paints the sleeve and makes the sleeve look marvelous. But I have exposed you to this. No matter what path you pursue, Nicolaiti says you keep going back to gesture and he trained alongside Bridgman in the same building in New York in the 1920s. Some really remarkable artists. Now, let's sum this up. One thing about balance is that it has to do with the figure itself. These figures are balanced. The feeling of level, of steady, or if they were not level, of tipsy, that let us stand still or break into motion. Now watch the screen, watch the screen. If we want to break into motion from those positions, you have this in your book. Yeah! Woo! One kind of balance is physical balance. The balance.
balance the figure feels. And look at the tools that he's using. Look at the straightness of that line and the awareness of that pelvic block and how exaggerated that is. And look at how exaggerated that is. That's physical. Now, I said that balance has two meanings. One is the balance of the figure in there that you're going to empathize with. Here's the second meaning of balance. Too much stillness. Uh. Too much movement. Uh. Too much straightness. Uh. Too much crooked or twin twisted or bent or curved. Too much anything. We can get too much of almost anything, and that's where the issue of balance has to do with the elements of picture making. One of the great skills of master artists is that they balance forms that are lined up and forms that are out of control. Thick forms and flat forms. Realism and stylization. Big and small left and right areas of the picture plane. Some composition books never even go any further than that. Soft edges and found edges. Oh, look how beautiful he does that when he lets that just ever so subtly whisper. Look at that gastrocnemius that ever so subtly goes behind there. He's got dark lines and light lines and straight lines and curved lines. And watch this curves that way and straights that curve the other way. This is a completely different kind of balance from what the figure is feeling. The figure does not know that the artist is making lines that curve one way or another. And it is these abstract artistic elements, lines and angles and straights and curves, these opposites that an artist balances. Now, you know what we've just done? You know what I've done? I've strayed away from Bridgman's book to talk about Nicolaides and my bridge, but you know what has happened? For a class about Bridgman, we came a long way from balance, but we didn't. We just demonstrated it subconsciously because balance is so fundamental to life that we see that when we have a book that is, how shall we describe it, uh, mostly drawings and really difficult text and over here, it's almost all words. The drawings in Nicolaides' book, many of them are, are counterproductive. And they're both teaching around the same time, and they're both teaching in the same place. And for the mid-20th century record, the big public record at least, of the Art Students League training for everyone previous to Robert Beverly Hale, these two teachers balance each other out. And if you want to throw a, tree, a third person into there, put my bridge into there. I think... That is one of the most beautiful photographs I have ever seen in my life. To think that that was 140 some years ago. And there's plenty more where that came from. Rhythm. The continuous slow motion picture has given us a new appreciation of rhythm in all its visible movement. Well, tomorrow we're going to talk more about rhythm. I'm going to try to finish in five, six, seven minutes here. We're going to talk about the, the difference between this way and that way and this way and the back and forthness. We're going to talk, we're talking right now about the this way and that way and this way and that way and this way and that way, the back and forthness that creates rhythm not just of the curves, but of the opens and closed. How could I ever draw and remember all of those things? Well, one way, one way would be to look at video and watch it 
one frame at a time. We have those tools. They didn't, they couldn't put it in quick time and look at it one frame at a time. But gosh, they studied it. They may have gotten more out of their primitive tools than many of us get out of our great tools. And the lessons that animators will give you of the way this cat's body, cat's bodies are great examples for how things change and the arcs, Richard Williams shows that. If you were to just take Chemo Nicolaides and say, you figure this guy's hatchet is gonna come down there fast and if there were moisture on it, it would splat out there below. To look at some of these drawings or any in your collection that you like. And that will have to do with weight and motion. As you study anatomy, you'll start to see that there will be specific muscles that will contract and relax to give you those motions. And one last lesson that will have to do with your project. This is from Nicolaides' book. One last lesson. Exercise 45, contrasting lines. As a matter of pure exercise, draw a straight line to represent some contour on one side of the model bottle. Then attached to that, make a curved line. Continue up or down that side of the figure or object, alternating straight and curved lines and attaching each line to the one before it and the one after it. Proceed in the same way all around the figure, but wherever there is a straight line on one side, try to put a curve opposite on the other side. Use five minute poses, always draw around the entire figure, and then look at this statement. These drawings will probably look like charts. Didn't he tell us earlier that if we don't empathize with the model and feel what the model is feeling, all we're gonna have to do have is a map? Now he's saying, make a map of where it's straight and curved. It's a whole different kind of balance. It's a whole different kind of alternation. It's graphic. Look what he says will happen. As a natural result of practicing this exercise, you will begin to search the model in order to discover which contours may be best expressed by straight lines and which by curved lines. From now on, this is when you've already drawn for three hours. From now on, you do not have to make the straight follow the curve and the curve the straight. You will use each when it seems most suitable. However, the principle of alternation, the principle of balance, the principle of rhythm, works pretty accurately and you should end up with approximately an equal number of straight and curved lines. Wow, okay. That was from Chemo Nicolaides, the book that people have opinions about. And when we go to Bridgman, we have pictures to work from. And if you go through these and choose your favorite and do what you will do with them and just do impulse drawings for the fun of it, just have a ball. Look at how this is about bodies in motion and this, look at that quote from Bridgman. The feeling of balance must be recorded in the flow or sweep of a drawing's continuity or rhythm. We'll take this up, uh, we've, got to, we've got to finish in a couple minutes. We're gonna take this up tomorrow of straight and curved and curved and backward curved. Okay, uh, let's go to your project. Chemo Nicolaides, this book was written to be used. It is not meant simply to be read any more than you would sit down to read through an arithmetic book without any attempt to work out its, uh, the problems it describes. Here is my set of exercises for you. I'm gonna have to go about five minutes over time. Session five project, that's for this next meeting, tomorrow. Strike the pose, analyze. Choose a pose that you like. From your photographs, from your Bridgman collection? Choose a dozen. Choose a pose. Strike the pose. Here's a little game you can play with your friend. See if you can describe your pose to someone not there. Have them try to strike the same pose. Have someone take pictures. See how badly you described it with words. 
Repent. Try again with a drawing. See how easily you can draw it? That is an argument for drawing. One drawing is worth a thousand words. No, ten thousand. Do this several times. On the poses you drew, notice or analyze placement of weight, directions of motion, a balance of straight and curved lines, and then redraw the pose as an abstract design of straight lines and curves. Now I'll take out the smart alecky in this. There it is. You can screen grab that, but Vera's going to post it on the uh, in the forum. You will have access to that. That's what to work on. Two opposite disciplines. If you were in this position, what would it feel like? Ah, okay, I know it. It's not research from afar. I've been in the skin of this. Then once you get some drawings, let's look at it and see how as a graphic design, it balances straight lines and curves. There'll be more than that, but one thing at a time. Now, Kimo Nicolaides' book is a boot camp. Half hour, half hour, quarter hour, quarter hour, half hour, one hour. This schedule represents 15 hours of actual drawing, which I have divided for convenience into five three-hour lessons. Okay, here's our class. Ugh. Hey, how's that, uh, how's that boot camp going with, uh, with Sergeant Vandruff? Oh, it's great. Come over and join us. Flower arranging and tea. But if you want to put three to six hours into this between now and tomorrow, you will be heightening your sensitivity. That was poses, balance, and a little on rhythm. I hope you learned. If you didn't, if this was too much theory, now is your time to get out of the classroom and out onto the playground. Moving from the boot camp to the recess metaphor. But you know, when you watch kids at recess, there are some of them, they are going to make the obstacle course difficult for themselves so they'll have more fun. If you're that kind of student, I hope the best for you in these coming hours, and I'll see you tomorrow at the same time. That was session four on gesture from our 12 session summer boot camp in 2020. If you want more videos, live sessions, and updates on other offerings, subscribe to my announcement list at martialart.com. You're here to study Bridgman. This is recording five on twisting forms from our summer boot camp, 2020. I think every person, Vera, I'm gonna step out. Every person should be greeted by name and a song. You can start, and uh, if you get tired of singing, it's Mike. Mike gets to add in. And Phoenix, if you're going to earn your keep as a uh, co-host, <laughs> this is your job. This is your job. Live is all about finding unlimited nows. Ah. A word of wisdom from Myrta. Thank you, Myrta. Here we are in July of 2020. This will be a year that history will look back on for more than one thing. But what I hope is that you will look back on your history as having gone through. We're going to develop the boot camp thing today. We're going to uh, look at Nicolaides and uh, Mybridge to do some exercises. And we're eventually going to look at the homework. 
And then I'm going to put you on some projects. I'm going to give you a choice of two projects. If you did the exercises last night or this morning on striking the pose, I'm going to introduce you to a new exercise by Nicolaides called Potential Gesture. Exercise number four. So he's got it right there at the beginning. This is an exercise I have occasionally made use of trying to explain what I mean by the impulse of the gesture. The model takes one minute gesture poses as usual and you make scribbled drawings. Instead of drawing the pose you see, however, draw what you think the model may do next. Of course, the pose you draw will seldom be the pose the model actually takes, but look why I put it in bold. The effort to realize how the model could move from his present position, what it would be possible for him to do and what he might want will help you to understand the forces at work behind the action you see. If you had a good acting teacher, many a good acting teacher will always point back to this, that it is not the pose. There was a kind of acting in the early 20th century that, as Don said, thankfully fell by the wayside where there were stock poses for grief and stock poses for joy and stock poses for all this stuff, and it always felt fake. And modern acting in particular got to understand that the action, the physical position, comes from something. Two things, actually. What the character wants and, very important, what the character is feeling emotionally. Now, that's what Nicolaides, at about the time that that fake acting method went out, Nicolaides was pointing artists to the same thing. If you're going to draw characters, you may not be acting them, but you sort of are. Animators do that too. And so, when you see this guy in this position and you didn't see any of this stuff ahead, you might figure that he's going to reach back even further. Or you might see that he's going to reach down to pick up a kid. Or, in this case, he happens to be ready to strike a blow. Well, it makes sense that if he was going to reach down to pick up a kid, he wouldn't want to get the greatest momentum. So he wouldn't have, watch this, watch this, he wouldn't have brought his shoulder back, right shoulder back, so that you can see his torso in side view, whereas his pelvis is positioned where you can see the back of it. But he's trying to wind up as much so that he's got the maximum swivel on the y-axis. That's called yaw, except I should be doing it this way, not this way, because he is swinging where it's going to go down and forward. I'm not going to have you do the exercise now. I am going to leave that up for a few moments so that if you get bored with talk. Oh, that's very good, Jesse. He also loaded weight on his left hip. He loaded the weight there. Why? Why? He might even be lifting that up a little bit. Why? So he can lean forward. The leg that's forward is where the momentum wants to be to get the maximum force. Now, you know what's interesting? A kid will do that when they strike a blow. A six, seven, eight, nine-year-old is gonna pick that up and they never thought it through. They merely felt it and yet the emotion led to all that analysis uh, on a subconscious level. But can we do that? Can we do that on a subconscious level with drawing? Uh, yes. A.B. Frost, Glenn Keane, Milt Call, if you don't know Milt Call, but these are people who have gone through a great deal of thinking it through, analyzing it, and studying it first. Now, I'm going to leave that up in case you say, Marshall, you go ahead and talk. I'm going to tune you out. I'm going to choose any one of those poses. Animators like to choose extremes. That's an extreme. It could be even made more extreme. You could say, no, the next thing he's doing is pull back even further because I, I, I'm not limited by a body. I can draw. 
and this could even push a little further forward. I only leave that up to you because I have a raised hand about what I was talking about. Let's go to Q&A. What is meant by the next pose? Anything? Barbara, a question like that, let me tell you what is meant by the next pose. What you choose. If uh, what I just mentioned, I may have answered it. An animator will choose keyframes or extremes. But I don't know that I'm going to make take time in the class to I'll take I'll take 30 seconds. Keyframes are important because without them you can't know what's going on in a story. Keyframes are the graphic novel uh, panels. Keyframes are the separate storyboard panel that makes point after point after point for a shot. Keyframes tell a story. Extremes are extremes of positions. And that's what I was referring to when you might say the next frame is him even further back. Watch this. You could say, and I'm going to make his whole body. He's going to pull on the muscles back here to make him go straight up and down and lift this foot off the ground so that he'll have even more momentum. Extremes are how far the pose goes before it reverses its position. Barbara, I hope that helped. That's the shortest I can do. Okay, the raised hand meant nothing then. The raised hand was like somebody throwing pebbles at the window saying, help, help, help. And then I say, hang on, let me finish my train of thought. And then I look out the window and I say, what's wrong? And you hear nothing. And so you say, I guess there's nothing wrong. All right, I'm gonna switch gears in a moment. But let's wrap up what the point was. Point number one was your homework was about empathizing with the character. Have you seen uh, the Proko video that he did on balance? Uh, I watched the premium one and gosh, that was really good. He took all the stuff in these different books about the vertical line and how if you get on one side of it, puts it in motion and how you can play with that. That's, uh, I think, of, of the sources I know, that's the best one for physical balance. This is not about anatomy as such. It's not about form as such. It's a little bit about technical understanding. It's a great deal about feeling and sensation and empathy and that I am not posing a mannequin. It's not a marionette that I'm struggling with to get it into a position. It's something that has its own impulses and being in touch with that part of this class, part of your homework. Hey, one of the things that happens when a person throws a punch is that they throw it forward. And then when they've thrown it forward, they don't say, and now I'll fall over that way. At some point, the punch has been thrown and they pull it back. And the loop that I showed you yesterday, as he goes wham, 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 wham. Because it goes back and forth or forth and back, it does something that is everywhere in nature. It's the first thing you heard regularly in your developing consciousness was, was a rhythm of your mother's heart, but not just of her heart, but of her moods and her motion and her stillness and everything else. One of the points Bridgman makes in the book is that there is rhythm everywhere. Life is full of this breathe in, but you don't breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. Eventually you breathe out, but you don't just breathe out, breathe out, breathe out. There is a back and forthness. Bridgman says this is important in a couple things. One is the body of that model, and the other is the pattern of your drawing. I am going to put this slide up of Bridgman's work because we talked about it yesterday. This is minus the pendulum. 
We talked about this yesterday. These are static, not in motion. Now we've got someone who's in motion and presumably if we were in his body and he has got the weight on this leg, you can tell because a vertical line tells you that. So if you're gonna sketch that, you might sketch a rhythm of meanders. But at some point you'd say there is his pit of the neck or the big bulk of his body. And if I run a vertical line down, it doesn't run right on that foot because he's not just putting his weight directly on that foot. He's got a little weight over here. And he's also got that leg pressed out there while he's got this arm thrown back here. So he's trying to distribute his weight over some center point so he doesn't fall over. So he's not really in motion, this is still, but what's he bound to do next? If he's having a ball, I think he is bound to switch legs. And that's potential gesture. You can imagine it. You can honor that it has extremes. Anna asks, is it equally beneficial to try drawing the previous action of a figure also, or is it only beneficial to predict the next action? Anna, good question. Yes, of course. It's useful to say what happened before this. George Pratt and I got to teach storytelling together. George Pratt had an exercise he puts students on that I thought was great. You take a photograph. It's cool to take photographs from another era. Sharpie.com uh, is a place of these old photographs and you go to the section at sharpie.com I'm putting it into the chat so you'll have the uh, the name uh, they've got a section on children these are our children in New York City and others back in old black and white photographs around the turn of the 20th century and early 20th century and uh, the reason they called it sharpie.com is they got some kid holding these oil pails named sharpie that's all they know about him and it's so iconic. You look at a picture and you say, this picture could be in the middle of the story. Tell us what happens before and tell us what happens after. Or you could say, this is the final picture in your movie. Tell us what led to this. Or the Norman Rockwell thing. He'd always start his illustrations with a drunken sailor uh, near a street lamp. And then just to see where it goes. This is the opening image of your story. What happens next? Any of those things are triggers for the imagination of the imaginative storyteller. So if that works for storytelling, back to your question, Anna, why not play this game? And there is one reason why uh, some people wouldn't play this game. It's because it takes time, it takes energy. It's an investment. You gotta sit down and really give yourself to it. You can't multitask when you do this. But if you're a storytelling image maker, if you're a storytelling figure artist, it would be a great thing to do. What happens before, what happens after, then if you are the graphic novelist, if you are the storyboard artist, uh, that thing that I showed quickly yesterday, that uh, slide from Sky Doll, you know, where there was a point where 2D animators were being laid off like crazy about 20 years or so ago. Uh, and there was a pause, and then there were all of these great graphic novels. Many of them came out of Europe, many of them came out of France. Um, they were animators who decided to do graphic novels. I mean, the drawing was incredible because animators will see it from this, 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 thousands of times. So when they are struggling to do a graphic novel panel, they don't really have to struggle see it they can choose the most evocative pose okay I hope that was helpful and you know I should have had this up while I was saying that because these are not necessarily sequential there is the skill of knowing the figure as anatomy and form And the skill of 
feeling the feelings of the human body with sensations. There's more than one skill there. You can be the best anatomist and drafts person and have no empathy with the body. That it's all a medical illustration. That it's all exactly accurate, but has no, uh, it's not a character. On the other hand, you can have tremendous skill at empathy with the body and not know how to draw it. Now, I hope you see my point. There's more than one skill just in this fundamental how to draw the figure. You can know anatomy like a surgeon, but not know the forms as blocks and cylinders that you can draw. Okay, anatomy isn't enough. You can know all the anatomy and none of what it does. That's why they separate in medicine, anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is what it is. Physiology is what it does and how it works. Artificial intelligence may know all of both of those things thoroughly, but it's a computer and it can't empathize with what those sensations feel like. But here is the next skill. When we make a drawing, we put lines on paper. And if they're all the same angles, or they're all the same thicknesses, or they're all the same closedness, or they're all straight, or they're all curved, regardless of whether they're human beings or not, if we put lines down that are too all the same, there's too much of the same thing and we need some graphic balance, some back and forthness. Look over there in the upper right. What does this have to do with a human figure? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with a human figure. She's lifting up some drapery. It has to, no, read what he says. Read what he says. He cares about that it's curving this way and it's kind of at a right angle. And then it's curving the other way and it's a more acute than a right angle. And then it's curving quite roundly and a very straight line there. And it's also, look how severe these lines are. And over on the other side, look how mild they are. They all line up on one line. Look at how heavy he dug in there and how light he dug in there. And look at how this neck, which is physically impossible, it makes such a beautiful, ah, graceful curve. But the audience can't even see it. The audience might not see it consciously, but the audience feels it. If you're taking notes, you might on one side of a portion of paper put human body. And underneath human body put anatomy function or physiology, what it is, what it does. You might put form, perspective. You might put empathy, sensation, gesture, pose. That would be on one side of the paper. On the other side of that portion of the paper, You would put uh, design, picture, composition. You might say graphic design, because that makes it clear. We don't mean the design of the body as a mechanism. We mean the design of the flat surface. Graphic has to do with writing on a flat surface. The calligraphy, the beautiful penmanship. Beautiful penmanship is beautiful penmanship regardless of what the words are. 
Beautiful design, evocative design, disturbing design, graceful design, deliberately awkward design, is that way regardless of whether it's a human body or an animal body or a fire tornado or a, a building. Okay, I hope I've made my point. Various skills, and we're spreading them apart to understand them, understand them and then we're spreading them apart further. Nick Nino Lobo, could you give us examples to look for? Artists maybe of these two different abilities. Yes, I can. In fact, Nino, the best example I know of is the one that's right in front of your face for this purpose. Oh, of the two different abilities, someone good, good with anatomy but lacking with connection with the body and the other way around, yeah. The best example of uh, good with anatomy but lacking of connection with the body uh, for empathy was deliberate. It was someone who that was their job. It was the thing that Robert Beverly Hale pointed out was a benefit of this book. He's not trying to show us how this guy works and his gesture and position and empathy. He is trying to show you pure anatomy and form. It's not a criticism, it's actually saying, look, we don't want to complicate matters. Rache is easier to learn anatomy from than Bridgman. Why? Why is Rache early? Why is Rubens, R-U-B-I-N-S, why are they easier to learn anatomy from than Bridgman? Because they only teach you one thing at a time, and Bridgman has got about five or six masterful things going in there. And uh, regarding people who are great at gesture, but they don't know the anatomy, there was a, a, a little girl named Nadia, N-A-D-I-A, who had a gift for drawing, British, I think. She didn't know anatomy or anything, but gosh, she'd draw a horse, she'd draw a figure, and they were expressive in remarkable ways. Uh, most children's drawing has this quality. Gymnasts are great models, his point of view. Yeah, yeah, gymnasts, skateboarders, athletes. That's what I recommended to you when you're collecting bodies worth knowing. People who are not thinking about the camera. If people are thinking about the camera and you've got a, a photographer saying, okay, a little to the left, a little to the left, okay, tilt that over, yeah, straighten that up. Then they're concerned with the graphic design and you can end up destroying the impulse that made it worth looking at. Greg, not, is there any realistic sculpture that has been shown to be unable to be truly be actualized? Of course. You couldn't actualize a bunch of Michelangelo's sculptures, and you couldn't actualize a number of these uh, figures that Bridgman does. What do you think? Look at that. Sculptors can do anything they want. You know, here's the subtext of a number of questions that I'm getting from a number of you. Uh, we, we found this out, that sometimes people think teachers uh, have more than they have. A lot of questions are, does this exist? Does that exist? And pretty much anything you ask, it does exist. And can you? And is it possible to? And should you? And those answers are always yes and no. Uh, I want to point us back to this. One thing you know you should do if you're developing your skills as an artist is to be aware of the, quote, certain amount of material, unquote, that Robert Beverly Hale said that an artist should study. Okay, I'm not done. I want to carry through with this graphic design thing. Here's what Bridgman means by rhythm and balance in design. We want this image, this rectangle, this thing we're making, this picture, We want this image to be a playground that isn't all the same activity. You say, oh, I get it, I get it, Marshall. You're saying we should paint playgrounds. No, 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 no. Nothing to do with literal playgrounds. This is a playground. You can have a battlefield. And when you make the picture, think of it as a playground for the eye. Figure it, figure it. And what does a playground have? It's not all monkey bars. We want some variety. 
and not just arbitrarily, not just accidental variety. We want to design a good playground where it goes from one thing to another, to another, to another with a sense of, well, how would you design a good playground? The stuff I want to do with the other kids. The stuff I want to do by myself. The stuff that takes strength. The stuff that takes concentration. And designing a picture compositionally, that's what design is about. That's a whole other skill than anatomy and form and empathy with the figure. It's what makes great artists, even some great artists who don't know anatomy and form. What makes good graphic design? A whole bunch of things. But here's one when it comes to rhythm and balance. Alternations, not too much of one thing back and forthness, back and forth of curves, back and forth of lefts and rights, but sometimes left right with the same kind of curve, sometimes curves that go different. Look what he's showing us over here. There's two kinds of curves. The most famous curve is the circle where it curves regularly. That's the definition of a circle. It keeps a regular distance from a point all the way around it. This one doesn't. This is a varied curve, but it isn't completely varied. It's more severe and less severe, but it's also all in the same direction, all convex to the outside. This one changes in its severity, but it also says I'll curve this way and curve the other way. When you see evidence of this in his subconscious choice, you say, how did he ever get there by isolating that thing and work?